It's time to embark on more of our adventure as we continue Ash Ketchum's journey through the world of Pokemon. From his first moment starting his journey in Pallet Town to the final moments the world just got to witness recently, Ash has had an incredible multiple decade span that has brought so much joy to so many, and gave new fans different jumping on points thanks to the generational structure of the franchise, which affects the show as well. Much like this series here on the channel, each part can be viewed standalone, but can also be viewed as part of a larger package. Documenting Ash and how he has evolved into who he becomes is a fun road to venture down as each generation brings out something new for him. Sometimes that means new friends to travel with, maybe even some old, and a whole lot of Pokemon pals to catch, train with, and build up some incredibly strong bonds to. Today we set out on our adventure in the Sinnoh region, the fourth generation of Pokemon that was a special moment in time for the Pokemon franchise. With this era being known for the jump from the more traditional Pokemon games before it, but now adding a, uh, a second screen and some updated graphics. Diamond and Pearl on the Nintendo DS were massive. This time in Pokemon was very exciting. Yes, I pre-ordered both versions to get the special styluses and stylus holder, so when it came to the anime, I was also very excited. With Pokemon taking over the dubbing and distribution for the show in the US from 4Kids Entertainment, this felt like a refresh. The last season, the last special, and the last movie were all the start of this full-on change, with Diamond and Pearl getting this whole run from the beginning with the newer cast, so it would really give the show a whole new feel. So after so many seasons, and this being their fourth main iteration of the show, and its continuing narrative, how did Diamond and Pearl hold up? Today we are going to explore the Sinnoh region with Ash, and see what it all truly had to offer. Welcome back, or for the first time, to this series. This is the complete guide to Ash's Pokemon journey. Previously on our time with Ash, we ended the final season having Ash go up against the various members of the Battle Frontier that took him on a surprise adventure around the Kanto region once more. After facing some of his toughest challenges and having some experiences with some old friends, both human and Pokemon, Ash gets his Hall of Fame moment and turns down being one of the Frontier brains for other challengers to battle. Instead, focusing on himself and heading home as we say goodbye to Brock once more, as well as May and Max, giving Ash a nice visit from his ex-rival Gary Oak, who has an Electivire, a new evolution for Electabuzz that was part of the Generation 4 batch of new Pokemon, giving Ash this excitement for another new region to explore after facing off against Gary for the fun of it all, and losing. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl were hitting the scene strong with a lot of excitement building up for not just this new generation in general, but for the fact that it was coming to the Nintendo DS. In more recent years, we have had a lot of nostalgia for Generation 4 thanks to the remake of Diamond and Pearl for the Nintendo Switch, as well as a brand new type of Pokemon game that builds so much lore into Pokemon and more specifically the Sinnoh regions, the Suian Past, and the Pokemon of creation with Pokemon Legends Arceus for the Nintendo Switch. There is a lot of love here for this generation as I have plenty of fond memories of this era that have made me excited to re-experience it all over again, as Ash now heads towards the Sinnoh region himself with only his Pikachu once more, and another sneaky traveler who wasn't ready to stay with Oak back home, so let's hop into the Diamond and Pearl era. Much like the start of the previous generation of episodes, we don't start the new series with Ash, but the first new companion we get along the journey. And here, that is Dawn. Dawn is a pretty fun and well-remembered companion. I think style-wise has one of the more memorable color palettes, and hey, as a beanie wearer myself, that's a few extra points in my book. We enter in on her journey just starting as she wakes up in Twinleaf Town, as her mother and her prepare for what's about to happen in her daughter's life. It's her turn to pick out a starter Pokemon from this region, 
region, before she sets off to discover the ever-growing world of Pokemon. The regional professor here, Professor Rowan, sends her an invite to come to the lab and do just that. So the three new Pokemon starters she must choose from are the Grass-type Turtwig, the Fire-type Chimchar, and of course, the Water-type Piplup. Right off the bat, we know that Dawn is interested in Pokemon contests, much like May found her passion for. So the possibilities of what each of these starters could really do is exciting to her. Other parallels begin once Dawn actually gets going, and while at the lab gets some time seeing how all of these starters are interacting with one another, it's honestly a complete mess. There's this battle between the Chimchar and the Piplop that results in them running into the woods, as now an Ariados is capturing all of the local forest Pokemon critters for some dinner. But don't worry, Dawn has to make a cool first impression for the audience watching, so she tricks the cool red spider Pokemon into taking itself out with the web, and Piplop is now safe with Dawn, regardless of how much the Piplop doesn't want to cooperate with her. Of course, Eridos comes back with backup and Piplop ends up winning. And while the early stages of bonding are happening here with Piplop and Dawn, she ends up passing Lake Verity, where she sees this mysterious Pokemon for a brief moment, the mythical Pokemon Mesprit, one of the three Lake Guardians introduced this generation. So there is a nice Ash Ho-Oh-esque moment that really sets up an interesting new character to follow alongside Ash. And that's who she'll really be this series, another character to follow rather than just a sidekick or companion, as they will eventually link up at least for this leg of the journey. Dawn is given all of the tools needed to start her journey though, some Pokeballs, her Pokedex, but more importantly, her partner Pokemon, which of course she chooses Piplup and begins her adventure. But this isn't about Dawn, this is about Ash, so where is he? Oh. Here he is, currently on his way to the Sinnoh region with his Pikachu, of course, but also his Apom, who decided to join Ash going forward. But as for Ash, he's pumped to be going to Sinnoh. He's ready to see what Gary was hyping up about this place, and knows that he'll become the champion of Sinnoh. Well, hey, don't get ahead of yourself, Ash. Who's that Pokemon? It's Kirby! But of course, Team Rocket ends up getting in the way right as they get to Sinnoh, and this ends up with Team Rocket being defeated, but Pikachu flying away, as Ash and Apom go searching for Pikachu right away. And it's kind of funny how Pikachu always gets the uh, short end of the uh, pokey stick here when it comes to arriving in new regions, I swear. But Dawn is still going on like nothing has changed, just going up the route as her and Piplup try and find their bearings together as she knows her full direction in her journey is to become a Pokemon coordinator, which is the term for for a trainer who trains their Pokemon to perform in Pokemon contests. But they end up coming across Pikachu who is currently by himself, and since Dawn hasn't had any luck capturing any new Pokemon yet, this is just another free opportunity for her to try again. And the two Pokemon battle here despite their energy levels, as Pikachu takes out the Piplup with a Thunderbolt, causing the Piplup to uh, fly back and hit Dawn's bike, frying it up as well. Once as an incident, uh, twice as a coincidence, but three times? This is a pattern of destructive bike behavior. Pikachu, though, is very much sorry, but sorry doesn't cut it here in the Sinnoh region. You gotta pay up. Dawn tries to catch him, but when it doesn't work, she realizes that this is another trainer's Pokemon, which means a nice insurance payout for that bike is definitely coming. Or it also means that her and Ash's past will become intertwined for nearly 200 episodes and a few movies. But when the Rockets show back up and their Pokemon come out to battle and chase off Pikachu, Piplup jumps in to help him, showing a level of respect to who Piplup was just bested by. The two defeat team Rocket though and end up rushing to the nearest Pokemon Center due to Pikachu's condition. Dawn decides that she will wait around to make sure Pikachu is okay and that he gets reunited with his owner. Speaking of his owner, Ash is still on the lookout for Pikachu. Apom is doing their best to assist as well, but help comes riding in as Officer Jenny was going by. So out of the severity of the situation, Ash gets a free ride over to Professor Rowan's lab, where Ash then gets notified that Pikachu was brought into a Pokemon Center, and right now the person who has Pikachu is out there looking for him. So Ash hightails it over to that area that the Pokemon Center is at, but along the way, a car pulls up beside him. And who could this be? Brock? What is he doing here? Well, funny story, so Brock met this girl here who is driving, Claudina, as she was planning to travel to the Sinnoh region from Pewter City, and he wanted to go that way anyway, partly because Ash, but also forgetting Ash because he was into her, much like any girl that he sees. But he decides to continue forward with Ash instead once they randomly run into him, mainly for the sake of her already being in a committed relationship. See you never again, random lady driving around. Brock notices Pikachu is gone, and Ash is frantically looking for him, so 
so the two journey forward like nothing has changed, except for his outfit, of course. Oh, but hey, along the way now, Apom runs into a Starly that causes a battle to flare up, and you know Ash needs a regional starting bird for his Pokemon team. So after a little battle between the two, Apom is able to land a hard hit to the Starly after taking a small beating, giving Ash an opening, resulting in him capturing his first Pokemon in the new region, a Starly. But something feels off. While Ash is excited that he caught the bird, he notices a lack of celebration alongside him from Pikachu, and gets pretty sad about that. But he gets nudged by Brock to use the Starly to help look for the Pikachu as Starly goes right back out and from high above goes on patrol. While all of that was happening, some mysterious purple-haired trainer watched Ash and makes some pity-filled remarks to himself towards Ash about capturing such an easy-to-catch weak Pokemon. Now that was up until the end of episode 2. The series premiered with three episodes back to back to back on April 20th, 2007, and it really acts as a nice trilogy of episodes that tell one larger plot to get us prepared for the rest of the series. The final part of this three episode introduction starts us off with meeting the purple haired wonder thanks to his Elekid's attack in the distance tricking Ash into thinking that it was Pikachu. It turns out that it belongs to this guy to their surprise, and when they ask about if he's seen a girl and this Pikachu, he says no. But then he makes a remark about Ash catching that star from earlier and saying is it the best one he could have caught or not, seemingly calling out his new Starly as weak and not worth the catch, giving Ash a full-on lecture-filled presentation of the Pokedex being able to evaluate the Pokemon by showing what attacks that it currently knows and what it can do, claiming it saves you all this time and hassle to know what to catch or not. So rather than seeing each and every Pokemon as the living being that they are, it only matters if you get the best one possible stats-wise, as the rest aren't worth a second thought. The example he shows are between three Starly that he has caught, with one of the three knowing a more powerful move in Aerial Ace, setting the other two free, telling them to get lost. Uh, yeah, I hate this dude, and I don't use the term hate lightly. Good on the writers, because if you're going to make a character feel like the rival or more of a bad person that the main character has to overcome in some way, then yeah, making me very much want to see that person lose everything is a great way for me to be invested in what Ash has going on. Ash, of course, rebuttals about that style of treating Pokemon overall, and that any Pokemon has the same chance to grow and be strong no matter where they are skill-wise. The trainer challenges Ash to a three-on-three, -three, but Ash can't right now, only having two Pokemon on him as they need to get back to searching for Pikachu. This dude calls Ash pathetic and heads out, but Ash can't worry about clapping back at this guy right now. He needs to get going. Team Rocket now is in a deep battle with Pikachu and Piplup, as they end up getting the upper hand on Pikachu and capturing him once more, knocking out Piplup in the process, but in the nick of time, Apom and Starly join in on the fight as Ash takes a note from Apom and begins climbing up a tree to help get a better angle on jumping onto Team Rocket's Machine of the Week. All these efforts result in Team Rocket's machine hurting itself and exploding, sending Team Large Red R blasting off again. Ash, Pikachu, and his other two Pokemon are all safe though, as they now end up reuniting with Pikachu and are extremely grateful that everyone is safe. Ash gets to also meet Don now, finally, and Brock helps heal up Piplop a bit, as they then call back to Professor Rowan, where they find out that a special care package from his mother had arrived and the trio now head back to the lab. Now, we can't just have Ash out here dressing in last generation's clothes now, can we? If Brock gets a new outfit, then you better believe Ash needs one because of action figures, I mean just to keep him fashionable. The care package had everything. New shoes, new clothes, a new backpack, but most importantly, a new hat. Goodbye, green. Hello, blue. He calls back to his mom to check in always keeping her in the loop like a good son should, so she's not up all night worried as well as checks in with Professor O, because we gotta check in with the GOAT, who also spends a lot of time with Ash's mom. But after this, Don makes a comment about traveling together after learning why Ash and Brock are here, knowing that they would all be going in the same direction. Much like Ash, Don wants to be the best like no one ever was when it comes to Pokemon contests, and has this powerful infectious enthusiasm to conquer the challenges in her way. Of course, she gets the yes from them as there seems to be a nice mutual bond after just coming together. Plus, with Ash being thankful to Don for looking after Pikachu, and Don being thankful to Brock after helping take care of her Piplup, everyone just feels right here in this trio. Playing into the whole every individual Pokemon is special and unique setup, Ash explains to Don about Pikachu being out of his Pokeball when she brings it up, causing Professor Rowan to mention every Pokemon may just have their own personality. So there could be many, many Pikachu out there, all different from one another. 
which we have seen in the series on multiple occasions. But just like clockwork when they leave the lab, they run into the purple-haired dude who reveals himself as Paul. The name's Paul. So now I can properly say, Paul, I don't like you. You are in the running for character I'd least care about if they were alone in a room with no escape with an irritated Machamp. This is the only Paul that I like. Hi, I'm Paul. Paul challenges Ash to a battle now because he stalked him some more and knows that he has three Pokemon again. The three on three battle would commence with the first trainer to two wins out of the three being labeled the winner. So finally, it's time for Ash's first real battle in the Sinnoh region with his Starly going up against Paul Starly right away. Playing into Paul's way of seeing things, his Starly ends up being currently more powerful and takes out Ash's. With them both now sending out their next Pokemon, Ash sends out Apom with Paul sending out his Chimchar. But with Apom and Ash learning the strategies of how Chimchar is battling, Apom is able to take out the Chimchar to Paul's surprise. So in round three, he sends out that Elekid from earlier and Ash sends out Pikachu. It's a battle of electricity and when Pikachu zooms in for a Vault Tackle, a move that Paul took note of before, you know, when he was doing the whole stalking and being a prick to Ash thing, and has Elekid protect itself as Pikachu takes damage only since that move pulls a lot from the Pokemon's energy. The battle goes back and forth a bit until both Pokemon faint, ending the match in a tie. Ash considers it a loss on the technicality of Pikachu falling down first, but Paul takes things literal and holds it to the fair ruling of telling Ash that it's a draw and he releases his third Starly that he had saying there will be stronger Starly out there, as this one was no longer good enough for him. But with this whole setup, that's where we start our journey. Ash has gained his traveling companions in both a familiar friend and an ambitious new one, along with a new Pokemon, new outfit, and is ready to explore the new region while having a new rival in the form of this Paul person. It's a great introduction that took the proper time to establish a lot of the base plots that will take place in the Diamond and Pearl era. Now again, while this is Ash's journey, I do bring up a few side things here and there that focus on the companions or rivals, usually to give context into something in relation to Ash. We quickly run into this person here, Nando. He's a bit cheeky. <laughs> Just kidding. He's extremely chill. He's a character that is playing in both worlds. Not sure what he wants to do more, go for badges or go for ribbons. He also has a Mew-shaped harp, and that's pretty cool, I must say. He runs into our trio and Dawn is looking for her first battle, challenging him and his Badoo, but then clarifies what is this battle for, where Dawn makes mention of making her way to the Sinnoh Grand Festival for the contest so Nando makes sure that this will be a contest type battle then, which is more so like a regular battle, but it has some flair and style to it. She ends up losing, which does get her pretty bummed out, mixing this with her bad luck of not catching any Pokemon every time she has tried so far, but they make their way to the Pokemon Center to stay the night, and Dawn gets a chance to speak with her mother, which I like that we get moments like this throughout the series, whether it be with Ash and his mom, or now Dawn with her mom, but these check-in updates make the characters feel a lot more real, especially when Dawn's mother takes her comments about nothing to worry about as making her worry as a mom, because that's what mothers are always gonna do. Ash ends up officially signing up for the Sinnoh League though, and Nando shows up for a quick heal as well, but everyone sees that something is on his mind, and not fully knowing what's up until Nurse Joy fills them in on his struggle to pick what his future focus would be. Ash and Dawn clash a bit when they both want him to pick their respective choices of focus and head out after him, eventually finding and confronting him where he cuts them off, creating silence and asking for them to just listen, where we get an ASMR moment of hearing nature, the Pokemon in the area, moving around them and just taking it all in. Thanks to a brief moment of calm, Don and Ash are able to make up with each other over the arguing as they mention and get into the special legendary and mythical Pokemon that they saw. Nando strums his harp and ponders over the wondrous fascinations of the world and Ash now challenges him to a battle. Only fair he battles in a regular style now that would be used in a gym before he makes up his mind for what path to take. Pikachu goes up against his Badoo, but as the battle goes on, the Badoo ends up evolving into a Rosalia, but Pikachu ends up still winning in the end. Nando is appreciative of both of them, and right then and there makes up his mind, claiming that he will be going after both, wanting to earn badges and ribbons alike. A nice episode here that builds up the interest in both Ash's journey and Don's, and telling you, the audience, that it's okay to follow both. Since it's also a new generation, it would only make sense that Ash would get a starter Pokemon from that region as well, right? So enter in Turtwig, who helps 
Pikachu out of a Team Rocket situation and afterwards, we find out this Turtwig is a lot like Bulbasaur and that it was helping protect this area and those that live around there and even more so like Bulbasaur because somehow an Oddish is thrown into the introduction mix. This lady named Clara talks about how she found Turtwig and took care of it and we see it has some of those Chikorita vibes by showing respect or fondness towards a person by giving them a big old bite, shown here on Ash. The two get the chance to work together in battle thanks to more Team Rocket interruptions and afterwards Clara notices that Turtwig wants to go with Ash and even runs up to him for a battle to catch him. So Ash happily agrees, having Pikachu come out and fight. Turtwig puts up a decent fight causing Pikachu to put in a lot of work dodging and maneuvering but in the end Pikachu gets the upper hand and Ash goes in for the catch, adding Turtwig to the team as they now continue forward towards Jubilife City. Right after this though the team runs into Paul once more and even with a new Pokemon, Paul thinks little of Ash and his trainer ways. This resulting in another battle thanks to Ash being easy to temper and of course all for his pride. Where his new Turtwig heads out to battle Chimchar at an extreme type disadvantage to it. And Turtwig just ends up eating the attacks to Ash's confusion but before things get way too bad, Team Rocket comes to ruin things and this forces Paul and Ash to work together to stop Team Rocket from doing their usual business and in the end after defeating them, Ash tries to make a play to be friends with Paul and squash whatever they have going on here. But Paul refuses this offer and walks away, so I guess the battle is over then? Anyway, Ash gets into this trippy situation thanks to Stantler's projections of illusions hitting him directly, and then Paul saves Ash from this because he's dying from the cringe that he is witnessing here. Paul catches the Stantler, but then immediately releases it as Ash is left confused once more. But more importantly, Ash now has a moment with Turtwig, as they are eating and they go over what happened in the battle earlier, claiming him to be stubborn for not listening to his battle commands, and that listening to him to dodge those incoming attacks was the proper call, that Turtwig just wasn't listening to, mentioning to him that Turtwig and him are friends, not just a trainer in Pokemon here. From here, Ash ends up having some more shenanigans in the woods, as we encounter Beedrill and this Ursaring, but Paul comes back and catches the Ursaring, so Ash makes a joking comment about him probably not keeping the Pokemon because of a whole list of weak related reasons, but to his surprise, Paul thinks he found a great Ursaring and decides that he should keep it. The two of them get back into the battle from earlier, having Turtwig and Chimchar come back out, as Turtwig finally starts responding to the commands Ash is throwing out. But even in doing so, Paul and his Chimchar seem to be getting even better and tighter on their battle strategies, where the two Pokemon end up in a climactic collision, but ultimately Chimchar emerges the victor, leaving Ash defeated for the first time by Paul as Chimchar celebrates a good battle and win. But Paul yells at Chimchar for this, prompting Ash to react, and Paul pushes back further now at Ash claiming that he doesn't care what a weak trainer like Ash Ketchum would have to say in a moment like this, and leaves, making Ash irate and fueled up for the next time that they cross paths. Later on, now in Jubilife City, Dawn gets everything set up for her Pokemon contests, as the show starts building up her own rivals and other characters as well, and even a secret villain who's in the contest coming from Jesse, from Team Rocket as well, also having an arc for the character that she plays to be in these contests. Oh, and by the by, Ash is also signing up for the Pokemon contest stuff as well, thanks to his Apom having an interest in it, officially getting him a Sinnoh contest pass, and all of the stuff that he needs. While Ash and Dawn make it past the performance part of the contest, so does Zoe, the new rival here for Don mostly, and Jessalina. Jesse's fake persona to be allowed to enter discreetly. Ash has to now go up against Zoe in the first battle here, with Ash using Apom and Zoe using Glamyow. Now remember, there is also a time limit here, so even if Ash's Apom was still standing and going in for the knockout hit, if the time hits zero, it's all about points, and the time does hit zero. And Zoe is declared victor thanks to the overall points left by each of them by the end, with Zoe telling Ash that the battle was great, and if the time didn't run out and that attack had landed, it may have been it for her and her clam meow. From here, Zoe defeats Don in the next round, then defeats Jesse, I, I mean Jessalina, in the finals, resulting in Zoe winning and getting her second total ribbon. Don has a moment where she calls back home disappointed she lost, and it definitely makes things harder since her mother was a contest performer and that she lost to a glam meow. 
a Pokemon that her mother has at home and used when competing. Her mother offers some encouraging words though, and also says that her friends are there for her. Zoe and Don have their moment of respect for one another to become friendly rivals, but something I find interesting was before their battle, Zoe mentions that Apom should be raised by Don since her path is the contest and this isn't truly Ash's scene at the end of the day. But ignore that for now as we have some training to do, with Ash working with his Starly to get stronger and more battle ready as Starly works alongside all of the other bird Pokemon to take out Team Rocket and through this they end up evolving into a Staravia and finishes off Team Rocket with an Aerial Ace. There's just something about Ash and his bird Pokemon that hit on such a strong connection each generation and I am glad that hasn't stopped here. Soon the group arrive at Orberg City and notice that Paul along with this Ian fella are walking out of the gym where Ash is genuinely curious if Paul had won and earned a badge but he shuts him up by telling him to mind his own business while Ian mentions that the gym leader isn't there at the moment and that the typing is rock Pokemon so Paul gets some ideas in his head and heads off to the Pokemon Center. Heck Ash even wishes him good luck and Paul smirks back at that comment because of course he does. Ash gets given a case for his badges to go in though and is told where to find the gym leader Rourke at which leads him to the mines. Upon finding him Rourke is very much into mining more so than being a gym leader often forgetting his duties at the gym apparently. So now that he heads back to the gym his first battle is with Paul as Ash and friends get a chance to sit in and watch the battle. After their battle goes on for a bit Paul takes the win and earns the coal badge and wants to just go on his way but Ash won't let him telling him to stay and watch his battle now. He ends up getting under Ash's skin and then Don's skin for his comments towards both of them and once the gym leader mentions staying he decides to do so. But now this hey Paul could you stay for an extra 30 minutes turns into hey can you stay for an extra day because Rourke tells Ash that they should battle the next day. But the battle that comes may not be that easy. Ash spends time planning which Pokemon to send out for the battle trying to figure out the strategy here. But when choosing Pikachu, Apom, and Turtwig, Staravia gets pretty disappointed wanting to have a chance to battle. Ash reassures the bird that next time is when he will call upon him. Paul walks up to them all and mentions to Ash that he just needs to copy what he did and it'll be a piece of cake. But Ash refuses to train or treat his Pokemon in such a way where there is no regard for the Pokemon's emotions. And just like clockwork, we find out that Paul gave up one of his Pokemon, an Azumarill, to a random younger trainer as this Pokemon was defeated easily in the battle earlier. Ash is irate over this, but Paul just does his walk out and leave thing, bringing us to the next day where the battle for the coal badge for Ash begins, with him sending out his Apom against Rourke's Kranidos, which is insanely powerful. That hard head is able to take out Apom, putting Pikachu next in line to fight in the battle, but ends up taking a beating. Even at one point looking like Pikachu was going to be knocked out, which would result in the battle being over, so Paul was ready to peace out of the building. Pikachu though seems to still be in for the fight a bit, but Ash brings him back and swaps him for Turtwig in that moment and the battle strategies really did start working well. For these two is Turtwig is able to eventually take out the Kranidos. Onyx is sent out next and knocks out Turtwig pretty fast, so Pikachu comes in to hopefully help against Onyx. But no matter how hard Pikachu fought in the end, the Onyx was able to get a solid final attack in, knocking Pikachu out, meaning Ash has lost to the first gym in the region and in front of his new rival, Paul. And before Paul leaves, he makes sure to get in one final comment to Ash, telling him that he has never thought lower of him than in this moment right here. Who's that Pokemon? Now, before we get to another rematch, of course, the gym leader's Kranidos ends up evolving into a Rampardos, and that's an even harder battle for Ash to face. Don ends up wearing a cheerleader outfit to cheer for Ash, which reminds me of Gary's groupies from the original series, but now the battle begins with Onyx being sent out and Pikachu jumping in for the rematch. After a good back and forth here, Pikachu lands a strong iron tail on the Onyx, knocking it out and having Geodude come out next, with Ash now switching to Apom for this battle. Apom's tactics with Ash end up working well against Geographical Dude over here knocking him out and putting Ash in a good lead for this battle. But now it's time for Rampardos. It's even stronger, it's a much bigger challenge to face, and within moments Apom is defeated and Pikachu comes right back out. But the clash of Pikachu's Iron Tail and Rampardos' Zen Headbutt favors on the side of Rampardos, allowing him to quickly go in for another and knocking out Pikachu. Next comes Turtwig, as they are both on their last Pokemon, and following through with 
with all of the strategies that worked last time, the Pokemon we now face is a lot more powerful thanks to it just evolving. So this is going to be a lot harder for Turtwig. So Ash starts having Turtwig combine some of the speed and power that it has by running around and still sending out Razor Leaves, as Rampardos retaliates in burning them up. But that backfires for it as his vision is obscured to Turtwig, giving an opening due to the element of surprise. Going low when it goes high, getting up behind the Rampardos and hitting it with a direct attack, thus resulting in a knockout and Ash becoming the victor of the match and being awarded his first Sinnoh League badge, the Cole Badge. So only seven more to go. Wow, I feel like we've gone over so much, but aren't too far into this adventure. I will say that Diamond and Pearl is the most spread out series thus far, really letting all of these side stories and other adventures develop as we still work on Ash's main goals. Some more fun stuff happens when they run across Pokemon Hunter J. Pokemon Hunters are those who capture and or steal Pokemon that they are hired to find for others, usually secret, shady, private type people. Well, she ends up stealing Pikachu as a bonus when Ash tried stopping her from stealing a Gardevoir, and in the end, while getting Pikachu back, Pokemon Hunter J stays another day free from capture by Officer Jenny, thanks to leaving with no trace and lack of known true identity. I think moments like this add some cool lore to the world of Pokemon, and I like how there are always different interpretations or iterations throughout different Pokemon media, whether it's in the games, manga, show, or something else. Just building up lore through these one-off characters or groups that appear through all these different mediums, I just think it's really cool. So now after making it to Floroma Town for a contest for Don to enter, we meet another person that is shown to be Don's rival, this time a less friendlier one than Zoe, and that's Kenny. Kenny just kind of teases her a lot and also notes that he lost to Zoe in a final round of a contest himself, and then going on to say other embarrassing things about Don. So she challenges him to a battle out of anger, but he doesn't care for that. Rather, he wants a battle with Ash to gain some real experience battling that Pikachu. This battle doesn't go anywhere thanks to Team Rocket, but after that gets taken care of, the contest goes forward with Don, Kenny, and of course Jesse, I mean Jessalina, and Don ends up face to face with Kenny in the final round, resulting in her winning and getting her first ribbon ever. As they continue on, Ash and Don face off against the champ twins, Ryan and Brian. So this would be a tag battle, two on two. But before they start, the Sinnoh Now team shows up to record this for TV, showing off trainers really giving it their all, as Don and Ash use Piplup and Turtwig against the Croconaw and Quilava. These twins are on a winning streak, and it doesn't break here as Don and Ash are not on the same page for this battle, causing them to argue and be uncoordinated and lose. Afterwards, the fighting continues until Pikachu quiets them up with a Thunderbolt and with Brock's help, giving them a moment to calm down and apologize to one another. Now they want to battle the Champ Twins again, but want to really work on a strategy that gets formed pretty naturally through the combined efforts of having Turtwig and Piplup work together, getting that practice in as they fight Team Rocket here. So now when the next battle happens, their strategies and ideas start to really gel well with each other, and they are able to take out the Croconaw and Quilava and end the winning streak for now. And they look good for TV since Don said it's literally the most popular show in the whole region. Later they run into Cheryl and her Chansey, as she's been trying to capture this one Pokemon and finally ends up capturing this Burmy. She introduces herself to the group and claims to be a treasure hunter of sorts following in her grandfather's footsteps. She is looking for enchanted honey. What makes it enchanted? I don't know, it's, it's, it's sweeter? I guess. She needs her newly caught male Burmy to evolve into a Motham, since female Burmy cannot, and Motham can lead the way to the location for the honey thanks to the scent of it, so Ash decides to help out and battle the Burmy to give it that experience to do so. But this Burmy is too weak compared to Turtwig, and is getting too hurt and not doing anything back to Turtwig, so Ash pulls back, deciding now to send out Pikachu to help in this situation, as now he acts over hurt in a dramatic way when Burmy finally goes into attack, and then Team Rocket steals the little guy as they want the enchanted honey as well for some reason but they can't get Burmy to evolve either. And as our group and Cheryl work together to take Team Rocket down and get Burmy back, he finally ends up evolving into Motham, who helps Ash and Pikachu finish off Team Rocket, at least for the day, and Motham is now ready to lead Cheryl and the group all along on this adventure to find this honey. And now we have a new member for our team for a little bit here. Along the way though, the group run into a woman named Gardenia, who is all about grass Pokemon as she is one of the upcoming gym leaders for Ash to face. But here, when she actually challenges him to 
a battle, she makes it clear that this is only practice and not an official gym battle or anything of the sorts. It'll be a two on two battle with Gardenia sending out a Cherubi, with Ash's Turtwig coming out ready to battle as well, with him seemingly being the more powerful Pokemon here. So she swaps out Cherubi for her own Turtwig, who ends up getting the upper hand and knocking Ash's Turtwig out thanks to just being a lot faster. Ash finally uses Staravia here for some help, and it doesn't really help because her Turtwig outmaneuvered it and struck at the right time. So Ash does lose, but at least it was unofficial, and he got some decent practice for when you actually have to face her for real. Eventually on this side journey with Cheryl, they end up finding the Enchanted Honey, as well as we get some time with cool new Pokemon like Combi and Vespaqueen, who at the end of the adventure, and after dealing with Team Rocket, give Cheryl a jar of the honey to fulfill her journey. She leaves the group after these few episodes, and our trio head up further down the road. But not too much further up the road, because the series went even deeper with things to do in the anime. It was truly side quest galore, at one point finding themselves entering a dress up your Pokemon contest with the winner receiving a special mystery Pokemon egg, and our trio and even Team Rocket all enter the contest of course, and Brock finally gets some love here, winning the contest by dressing up his Krogunk. And even he is surprised to win as he was just downing his chances here, but he gets the egg, so I'm happy for him. They randomly run into Lucian, a member of the Sinnoh region's Elite Four as Ash gets to know about what happens if he wins the Pokemon League conference, and that's getting a chance to enter the Champion League where the Elite Four await, as well as the champion of the league. Dawn ends up in a battle with Lucian thanks to her newly caught Buizel, wanting to go paw to paw with such an experienced and high regarded trainer. Ash of course always wants to get too far ahead of himself and battle him, but again he gives that attention to Dawn here instead, giving her a chance against his Bronzong. Clearly this didn't go over well and things end up bad for Buizel, as Lucian apologizes for getting too into it and unleashing his high leveled Pokemon's power onto a newly captured Pokemon. After recovering from this, Buizel is definitely down in the dumps about everything, and he knows how powerful he can be, so through some quick training with Dawn so that they can bond a lot better together, Buizel is ready to challenge the Bronzong again. But as the battle was getting heated up and Buizel was putting up way better of a fight, Lucian calls the match before things get too out of hand, claiming how great they do now work together in battle and wants them to continue to find their groove, as he decides to hold back any more power from his Pokemon and leaves. And Ash, well, he never got the chance to battle but knows that he will face him at some point, as they now continue to return a city, where a few things go down. One, we see Nando again, he has a sun floor, and he's doing great, having a ribbon and a badge. And oh, is Gardenia the gym leader in this specific town? That's great! More interesting though is the fact that this is where we get our first meeting with the evil team of this region, Team Galactic, where apparently Team Rocket was hired by them to steal this orb from the History Museum that is linked to the regional legendaries Dialga and Palkia. The orb is rescued in return in the end, and Nando tells them about the creation trio created by the original one, as well as the three lake guardians as we then ponder on the people who put Team Rocket on the mission as we see one of the commanders of Team Galactic named Satter, looking disappointed in Team Rocket's failures as we eventually know more about these people at some point, I guess. But now it's time for another gym battle, Ash versus Gardenia for real this time with Cherubi versus Turtwig coming out first. But now Cherubi is really giving Turtwig the business here as Ash recalls Turtwig and sends out Staravia for some aerial action as a non-stop barrage from the air and using the clouds and sunlight to mess with Cherubi's abilities to end up taking it out. Gardenia seems impressed by Ash's strategies thus far, sending out her Turtwig as Staravia continues to battle until her Turtwig lands a solid tackle on it, knocking him out. Now it's Turtwig v Turtwig Part 2, as the two go at it like before, with speed, good dodging, and some powerful attacks. The battle is pretty solid on both sides until each run at each other with a tackle almost causing a double knockout, but Ash's Turtwig remains on his feet, bringing her to her final Pokemon. And that Pokemon here is Roserade, and she quickly takes out what's left energy-wise of the Turtwig, bringing Ash's final Pokemon out as well with Apom, who decides to make a really fun and whimsical entrance, with style and skill all in a dazzling fashion, and is able to finish off Roserade and win the battle, giving Ash a big ol' hug as he wins his second Sinnoh League badge, the Forest Badge. Also, seeing how Apom is excited to show off her flair in battle, maybe those comments about Apom being raised by Dawn and having Apom work on competing may have some validity to it. Also, Brock's egg hatches and becomes a happening, the baby evolution of Chansey, so that's fun. But you know what else is fun? The relationship between Ash and Gary, as it's finally time for them to reunite. Uh, oh, it's not yet? 
we have some more Paul stuff instead. The evil new rival instead of exploring the ex-rival now friends again. Okay, fine. But it better include Cynthia. Oh cool, she's here. But before that, Paul shows up and Ash is eager to talk to him, trying to show off that he now has two badges since they last met. But he doesn't care one bit, of course. He rather focuses on Cynthia and demands to battle her, six on six, right now. And I'm not sure if you know this, but Cynthia, well, she's the Sinnoh region champion trainer. Paul also has a Torterra now, which is the final evolved form of Turtwig, as well as Pokemon such as Weavile and a Murkrow. But in the end, forfeits and gets made fun of by the crowd of people watching, where Ash actually jumps in to defend him based on thinking that he made a smart and safe call to finally protect his Pokemon. We get to learn a bit more about Paul here as Cynthia helps heal his Pokemon as they continue to talk. We learn that Paul has been traveling to the previous regions and training as he competed and lost in the respective conferences. For some reason though, he is extremely hard on his Chimchar, not allowing him to receive any compliments without him pushing back, causing Ash to get very angry at him and call him out on his training practices more and more. Cynthia steps in to really get into this discussion, taking them to a stone tablet where she mentions that she used to aggressively train and train with no thought more than that with her Pokemon, but then she truly discovered and understood the different personalities that Pokemon have, and it changed her connection to viewing and respecting these creatures more. He doesn't really click with all this because after Team Rocket ends up capturing his Chimchar, and he becomes free once again thanks to Ash's help, he watches his Chimchar, who he pushes too hard, fall to the ground and has no reaction other than to view him as useless, if it could just be captured so easily by those idiots, not caring for the health of this Chimchar. Chimchar at all. Don gets at him for those comments, but Cynthia takes control and is trying to make sure that Chimchar is okay and that anything other than that right now is not important. After that whole situation, she leaves for some emergency, one that is dealing with another orb that has some relation to the other orb that we dealt with before that has the connection to the legendary Pokemon. Okay, now we get to talk about the ex-rival, as when they all notice some trouble with Pokemon Hunter J at Mount Coronet, they bump into a familiar face, that being Gary Oak. Gary talks about how he is now a part of this environment environmental project that would protect part of the mountain as a Pokemon preserve, and works alongside Professor Rowan as the mission is to bring these shield on into safety. Ash offers his help to Gary, to which he is thankful, and the two work together to get to the extraction point, while still butting heads a bit on if they should be attacking or only focusing on getting the Pokemon out of there. After a daring fight to rescue a shield on that was taken by the Pokemon Hunter, the group are able to make sure that the Pokemon are free and that the job for the Hunter is called off, and they all leave as Jenny is determined to figure out who this Pokemon Hunter J truly is, and to take them down. Gary leaves on a nice note telling Ash that he is thankful for his help and that they'll be friends to the end. They've come so far and I think that's pretty cool to hear. They also run into Paul again randomly throughout this cave and maze area as they continue on. This girl named Mira saves them a lot of walking for multiple days by eventually helping them teleport right to their next destination, Heart Home City, thanks to the help from her Abra. Once there, we get to see Nando again. We also learn that we have to wait for the gym battle because the gym leader isn't around. And I'm sure this won't play into a long plot point of stuff to just wait around for to happen. But there is also a tag battle competition in the city where Ash and Brock want to enter. Dawn goes off to do her contest, but only ends up not making it past the performance stage, sadly. But it's okay, she joins the tag battle competition with the boys as things get spicy when Ash is paired with none other than Paul. They really just can't escape this dude, can they? Their two Pokemon for the battle are going to be Pikachu and Chimchar, as they have to face a Rhydon and Magmar. And despite the issues between the two trainers, Pikachu and Chimchar are able to effectively work together in taking down the larger Pokemon, advancing them to the next round as well as Don and her partner, and Brock and his partner advancing as well. Throughout the night, the trainers spend time working with their Pokemon as Paul is having his other Pokemon non-stop attack his Chimchar to push him to a limit of awakening a do-or-die strength. The shouting matches towards Paul continue as Paul mentions that getting hurt from the weaknesses that you have will make you stronger to them. That's why he lets his Pokemon take head-on attacks to build up against what they are weak to. Ash counters that he should be working on the strengths that Chimchar already has to improve those to great heights, but Chimchar is stuck listening to how Paul wants it. Ash tries to tell Chimchar directly that things can be different, but Paul walks away with his Pokemon. His continued training leaves him extremely weak and unable to stand, with Paul trying to force him to, but Ash and Don stop this 
from happening and make sure that he is taken to the Pokemon Center. Brock helps treat him as we get a little backstory from Paul about how he came into getting Chimchar, seeing firsthand how powerful he was when pushed to a do or die moment being chased by some Zangoose, or, or would it be Zangeese? Either way, he was impressed by the power Chimchar had and wanted to capture him. He only wants to push him to that limit so he can be that unstoppable force of nature, but regardless of that story, everyone agrees that he should not use Chimchar for the next round, and he should let him get the rest that he truly needs. But when the next round starts in the morning, Ash and Paul send out Turtwig, and to shock everyone, he sends out Chimchar. And of course, you know, everyone's booing this man. And to top things off, the Pokemon they face are a Metagross, which is annoyingly tough enough on its own, but also a Zangoose, which has to be the weirdest bit of coincidence in such a random way. The two starter Pokemon work together and go back and forth saving each other from immediate harm, but Paul stays pretty silent now, noticing that this isn't going to get Chimchar to that level he wanted him to get to, and decides to mentally check out of the match. So Ash takes control of the team, commanding both Pokemon to a surprising victory to advance them forward. Don and Brock also won their battles, but Paul is the only one not celebrating. In fact, later that evening, he sets his Chimchar free, kicking him to the curb, telling him to get lost like the rest of the Pokemon who he deems too weak or not good enough. This is where Pokemon hits me in the feels for how sad this is. The abandonment that Chimchar feels after being loyal to Paul and going along with everything he's put him through up until this point as Ash and the others lay into Paul, as they should. But he truly has no emotions towards any of it. Ash is heartbroken for the little guy, but does the most Ash thing possible. Offers Chimchar to join his team and train in a proper way that shows Paul that his way is harmful and wrong. Especially after his disgusting comments regarding both of them as deserving the worst and finding that in each other. Chimchar, on the verge of agreeing, or so it seems, when out of nowhere, Team Rocket attacks and takes Chimchar. But it's resolved really quick, barely an inconvenience, as Chimchar officially decides to join Ash in a very fun jumping in the air moment. And just like that, Ash gets a new Pokemon. But they still have a random tag battle tournament to complete, where when the two come back together and they have to face off against Brock and his partner, Ash's Staravia and Paul's Torterra take on Brock's Krogunk and Jolly's Farfetch. And they end up winning, but at the cost of them being very uncoordinated as partners, arguing during the battle and Paul claiming that his Pokemon did all the work. For the final battle, Ash and Paul send out Chimchar and Elekit as they face Dawn and her partner Conway with their Buizel and Heracross. The battle gets tougher and tougher as Elekid gets constantly hit hard with attack after attack but doesn't give up. But this pain turned into Elekid evolving into an Electabuzz, and the two take down the opposing Pokemon, making Ash and Paul the victors of the competition. Paul says that they only won thanks to his Electabuzz, and Ash knows Chimchar did a great job out there. And now both trainers here win Soothbell as their prize for winning the competition, as Paul wonders over how such a dysfunctional team was still able to win and defeat every other opponent. And later on, he just tosses his prize bell over to Ash, not wanting it and heads out. And a sooth bell is an item that increases a friendship status, so it just makes sense that Paul gets rid of it. Now, the crew gets ready to head to their next city to earn his third badge. Wow, only third badge, huh? Whew. We just reached the end of the first season of Diamond and Pearl, and we only have two badges. Well, okay then. Before we continue on to the next season, we need to make a quick detour over to our first movie of this generation with The Rise of Darkrai. Now, I want to make note that when looking at the movies, it gets hard to build more onto Ash's journey, as very rarely are things in the movie ever mentioned or brought up in the series proper. But the movies do offer some fun moments for Ash, and the current crew he's traveling with, that are worth the highlight anyway. Again, regardless of any effect that it has on the journey as a whole. But for the first movie that is part of the Sinnoh era, The Rise of Darkrai, it brings our group to Alamos Town, as wouldn't you know it, things are happening, and we are now going to get involved, with distortion of reality, kind of being noticed in some creepy fog that starts rolling in. The Pokemon and the people in that area haven't been able to sleep too well, and that's thanks to an unusual amount of nightmares that they're all having. You'll notice right off the bat that this movie is a lot more horror-centric than anything we've seen in Pokemon movies yet, building up this looming and mysterious threat of Darkrai, whose presence and entrances leave you a little more than uncomfortable. If you need to watch this one with the lights off, I understand, and I won't tell anyone. I tweeted it out. I'm sorry.
I mean, if you also add in the phantom Pokemon stuff that's happening, along with the way that you can't escape the town, it gives you some pretty dreary vibes. Especially since we also have to deal with both Dialga and Palkia, who are duking it out between dimensions, as it also affects this one as well. Regardless of all the Dialga and Palkia and even multiple related Darkrai related things that happen in the regular show past this, our group aids in all of this as a special 100 plus year old song is what's needed to be played to calm the fighting and hopefully help save the day. The secret to that song is built up through this added in character's great grandfather's past, building the city's odd but elegant landmark here, as well as the song being related to what this character's grandmother taught her. After some time hanging out in the city and understanding the truth about Darkrai, it genuinely is cool to see this random city get pulled into this pocket of empty space, in its own dimension being the battlefield for the space and time titans to clash in the skies, or, or space above. How are they all able to breathe right now? Through this battle ensuing, the city becomes Becomes the place that's in danger. So Darkrai does his best to distract the Titans here, and in some ways he's just full on fighting with them, as over time the city is slowly disappearing. And in the end, Darkrai pulls an ash and dies. But it was for the greater good, you know, and it's fine because he comes back anyway. Thanks, mythical darkness space resurrection. That was pretty cool of you to do. What I like about this movie here is that it did try to fall into a more horror filled setting with the themes and visuals, allowing for a few moments that truly do leave you sitting there a little over focused on what's going on. It never goes too far into any of those interesting factors though, sadly, leaving the rest of the film to feel less exciting because of it. It spends time building up these side characters that are all tangled into what's going on, as they also have this love triangle that only matters at the beginning, just for one moment as we get introduced to everything. So I feel like they were trying to put something over in this court, but if not, it kind of just feels like it was there for no reason whatsoever. But despite that, I like our main two here's relationship with Tony and Alice the more we spend time with them. And as for this dude here, he just gets turned into a licky licky for the whole movie and talks with the mannerisms and movements that makes it a pretty fun little gag. Darkrai also gets treated as the villain in the movie for a while as he would most likely be to blame for the nightmares and other issues going on. But as we later find out, he's not this bad, mean spirited or evil Pokemon. He actually is just misunderstood and alone, but thanks to his creepy factor of just being himself, he gets attacked by the locals and in turn defends himself. Or then because of his powers, nightmares get destroyed distributed out. But by the end of course, he is shown to be the hero, thanks to what his true nature actually is, as we ease into seeing him for more than what people are scared of him by. It's a great introduction to the Sinnoh era of movies that gives us some high stakes, with Ash mainly just being there to assist on things and react with everyone else until needed. But here, the main battle feels like he, or any of the friends, weren't truly able to aid in anything for the most part, so there is some good and some eh here. But I like the ideas this film brought into the Pokemon world and I think leaning more into horror sometimes is pretty cool. Like in their promo shorts for Legends Arceus and Scarlet and Violet, where we've watched Pokemon kill some people to show off the deadliness of those Pokemon. Either way, the movies don't hold too much weight for the journey we're all going on most times, but the experience in seeing something like this and aiding in where you can is cool to know, and at least see for Ash to go through. So now after that fun little detour, we must continue on to our next season in the Sinnoh region, to see more of where Ash's full-on journey with real growth and changes take place. Who's that Pokemon? It's Cubone! Cubone, bone, bone. Starting off the new season, Pokemon DP Battle Dimension, on a particularly strong note is the bonding of Ash and his new Chimchar, spending time helping it overcome the fear and issues it has with Zangoose. This is big for Chimchar as he conquers that fear and is able to be stronger thanks to Ash's training versus how Paul was doing it, making him emotional and grateful. They also run into Gardenia again, who also happens to run into Team Rocket and likes James's Cacnea, and offers him to tag battle Ash and Dawn, to which Ash and Dawn end up winning as the episode focuses more on James's story, as the show will often give Team Rocket some deeper story beats to explore, with James letting Gardenia take his Cacnea to help train it. Same as when Ash left his Charizard to train, or even his Primeape, and I'm sure future Pokemon as well. Similar to that with a Pokemon wanting something from their trainer to help get them towards their goal somehow, we get to something that was building up through the contest stuff and just in a certain Pokemon's own wants and that is the decision about Apom for Ash. Clearly the contests are her favorite thing more so than battle. Always watching Dawn train and is shown to give a special entrance when coming out for battles anyway. Zoe once again notices what's going on and plants the idea of Dawn trading her Buizel for Ash's Apom and everything may be a stronger fit there. The two at first are 
are kind of stunned at the thought, but see a trade happen at the Pokemon Center and take a moment to reflect on the Pokemon and their personal connection with them and all the training that they've been through already. So to pretend like they did trade, they just borrow each other's Pokemon and end up having to practice with them by, of course, facing off against Team Rocket. And things go pretty well, so in the end, they decide that they are comfortable with this trade, as they now officially swap the Pokemon and the two make a promise to them, claiming to use Buizel in the next gym battle and Apom in the next contest. This is an interesting trade based on how close Ash and Apom are, with the Apom sneaking aboard with Ash towards this region not wanting him to leave without her, and earlier in the show when Don was able to catch the Buizel, Ash also wanted to catch it for himself, so there is some attachment for Ash to both of them. It's not long though before Apom ends up evolving into Ambipom, and some more of Team Galactic's plans unfold, with Saturn stealing a special cube artifact that also has all these unknown involved, and it's a wild time for everyone. Dawn's next contest doesn't go well as she doesn't get past the performance stage once again, and as a result, she feels pretty low and has lost a bunch of confidence she had. But eventually, she gets to see her old childhood friend, Leona, and the two of them have a tag battle with Ash and Brock. Ash's Chimchar and Brock's Sudowoodo against Don's Piplup and Leona's Swinub. And thanks to Blizzards and Mimics, the result is all of the Pokemon being frozen solid, so it's just a tie. The time spent seeing her friend and getting into a fun battle brought her confidence back up, but she still has a way to go. Although it was still nice to see some service to her arc here. We also run into Polygon as he catches a Gliscor, the evolved form of Gligar, as Ash catches a Gligar. You know, if I didn't know any better, I'd say this show is trying to tell me something with Paul getting the evolution and Ash getting what seems to be the slow flying Gligar. I'm picking up what you're putting down. But eventually the trio make their way to the next city, Veilstone City, as right away they experience some Aurora Spheres flying towards them as some lady is dodging all of these attacks coming from a Lucario. But all this excitement here is disrupted as Pikachu and Piplup get into a spat with Electabuzz, as the lady sends in her Lucario to stop whatever was going on, as a different purple-haired dude who isn't Paul comes over and mentions that the woman with the Lucario is Meili, and that his name is Reggie. He turns out to be none other than Paul's older brother, regardless if Paul has the face of a 40 year old man, and that this Electabuzz, well of course it was Paul's newly evolved one, but he didn't outright release it or abandon the Pokemon, he just left it with his brother for the moment to train and be taken care of since Reggie is a Pokemon breeder, which is an interesting duality in the family, one brother who truly cares about Pokemon and one who only sees them as tools to use for winning battles. Through speaking, Ash finds out that Paul had already clearly been through here, and he even already defeated the gym leader who happens to be Maylene, but she's not really into the whole gym battling thing at the moment, and Lucario keeps attacking her to push her back into it, as she is a newer gym leader and has these doubts of her right to be a gym leader. Also, it doesn't help that after Paul won, he said to her that she is the weakest leader he's ever fought, which is par for the course when it comes to Paul, and Reggie mentions that he's very much been like this forever now. But later on, Don and Maylene have a moment to speak as we just recently spent time with Don overcoming some personal confidence issues a bit, thanks to the whole losing streak that she's been on for the contests, and Don asks for a battle with Reggie, and Don makes note that she wants to battle Maylene. At the same time, Reggie wants to battle Ash, so of course he's in on this. Reggie just has a completely different vibe from his brother, making note that Chimchar seems the best he's ever been happiness-wise, as we see badges and frontier symbols collected around the house, and they are Reggie's, but one symbol from the battle frontier is missing, the one that Brandon gives out the brave symbol. Brandon was a character that we talked about when going through the Battle Frontier arc as Ash had the hardest challenge through him, and I made note that he may be important in the Sinnoh arc just a little bit as well. But for now, Reggie has Babarel come out versus Ash's Turtwig as Ash has Gligar. Not go out in battle, just watch firsthand from the sidelines. Turtwig shows off how much he has learned and the strength that he has by being able to take down the Babarel with an energy ball. So when he now sends out Swalot, Ash swaps Pokemon to send out his Staravia, which this battle feels like anti-aircraft weaponry taking down a flying threat, and as the result of this, Staravia takes a heavy hit and falls from the sky. Reggie thinks that Ash's Staravia was doing a great job, but to one-up him, he then sends out his Staraptor, the next and final evolution for Staravia. So Ash keeps Staravia out to watch as Pikachu now jumps in for the battle, and his Staraptor is no joke when it comes to power, knowing a move that Reggie will help teach Staravia for Ash's training called Brave Bird. But in the end, Pikachu holds strong and beats out the Staraptor, and Ash is considered Considered the winner here. So being impressed with Ash, Reggie tells Maylene that she should battle Ash. But before that can happen, Dawn gets to have her battle with Maylene to truly help both of them out in their own individual confidence struggles. And it does just that. Who 
knew? So Maylene agrees to battle Ash right now, another three on three. She sends out Machoke and Ash uses Staravia once more. And this birdie is determined to make a difference with its skills in battle. And after escaping a seismic toss, Staravia is able to take out the Machoke and go up against her next Pokemon, a Metatite. But the focus the Pokemon has builds up too much and is able to get to the Staravia. But Ash calls him back quick and sends out Chimchar for now. But the confusion attack that Metatite keeps throwing out results in Chimchar getting hurt and not having control of direction, so Ash re-swaps back out to Staravia, who wants to prove something here and finish the battle, showing off finally that it was able to learn the Brave Bird move, and her Pokemon is defeated, leaving her final Pokemon down to the one and only Lucario. Without wasting any time, Lucario finishes off Staravia from battle, and Ash brings back out Chimchar, and with as much of a fight that he ends up giving the blue anthropomorphic dog, he ultimately gets defeated, leaving Ash with a final Pokemon as well, getting the chance to use the Buizel in a battle that he promised. And throughout this fierce showdown, Buizel starts having some issues with battle commands, and ends up just barely pulling through with some of Don's encouragement. So there's definitely some post-trade personal things to work out. But giving it all he's got, both Pokemon end their fight with powerful attacks on each other. And because of this, both Pokemon get knocked out at the same time, making this gym battle a draw. Which means we have to do this all over again, right? <laughs> Wrong. Maylene decides that Ash gave her one of the best battles she's had, and thanks to Dawn and Ash's battles, her restored faith in herself and her confidence to be the best gym leader she can be is back, giving Ash the cobble badge anyway. Which I'm not saying anything about. We only have three badges in at this point, and I feel that we're fairly deep into the series, so yeah, thanks for the lore building here. But let's keep moving with the journey, thanks for the badge. And some things do get a bit fun here with the whole new side team of the region evil subplot that they have. As in the last generation, we had Team Magma and Team Aqua is showing off more devious plans than what Team Rocket usually gets into, as now we continue seeing where the plot of Team Galactic goes, and it's pretty interesting to me, as if I don't know what happens already, but for the sake of pacing in this video, we shall explore it together. Aside from operating on the sidelines now, Ash and company are finally made aware of who these people are, meeting them head on. Paul is also in the area, and he is speaking with Reggie, and Reggie does his best to let Paul know how great of a trainer Ash truly is, but of course, he could care less as hearing his brother say that just annoys him greatly. Team Galactic, though, is doing some weird evil organization stuff by having this object hover and transform around these meteors lodged into the ground of this one area, as now they begin to glow, shooting light beams into the sky. Clearly, this catches a bunch of people's attention. Kind of hard to hide something like that, but at first, our crew thinks that this is Team Rocket behind everything. But Officer Jenny mentions it's Team Galactic, as the meteors begin to rise from the ground. Saturn and his grunts here send out some Golbat to battle with everyone so that they can distract them as they enact their plans. As Reggie brings Electabuzz to fight and offers to help out with Pikachu, teaming up with a semi-rival Pokemon as they now pull off some powerful electrical moves together. And Pikachu even makes sure that Electabuzz is doing okay. How nice of them. All of the Pokemon are pulling off some really cool moves here in general, doing their best to fend off Team Galactic in their evil doings. Each Pokemon here is playing their part as Pikachu also jumps in with Lucario once the meteors are now stopped from being lifted, sending some attacks at the helicopters fleeing the area. For whatever they're working on, Ash and friends are clearly in the mix of it now. And while they didn't catch Saturn or fully bring any of the team to justice, the mission to secure the meteors and keep everyone safe was a success. Speaking of Saturn, we get to learn where their next plan lies. We don't know much from just the anime alone for what this team is up to yet, but we do know that it ties into the creation trio thanks to what they've targeted thus far. But I do like that Pikachu and Electabuzz find a nice respect for one another, post their battle history with Paul after now coming together for the greater good. But you know what also fills me with joy? The Pokemon Rangers. Again, I won't go into the video games, I'll save that for my gaming channel, Jordan Fringe Gaming, go subscribe. But in the anime, they've appeared a few times as Ash and friends end up getting in the mix of their own stories happening, and they even have that movie we talked about. But here they cross paths with the Rangers once more in a special two-part event regarding a kidnapped Ryalu, which is the pre-evolved form of Lucario. I like that the story continues based on Ash's experience as we've learned in the Lucario and the Mystery of Mew movie, which is that Ash has the ability to use Aura, as Don for the first time learns about that, as well as all of this Ranger business. Imagine traveling with someone for a while, truly getting to know them, and then one day randomly learning that they have some mystical powers and it's something that that he just forgot he could do or ever brought up. Either way, this special pair of episodes brings in more of the Pokemon Hunter J person's story.
storyline. And she's after this Ryalu, at one point turning Ryalu into a frozen figurine, and is able to take the Ryalu away from Ash. Ash isn't giving up that easily though. He never lets a Pokemon suffer, or in this case be stolen and sold to a client for nefarious reasons, so he just tries to run up on her after sneaking on a ship, and is quickly stopped by her Drapion, which, side note, I like Drapion a lot as a Pokemon, but regardless, she has a hatch under Ash's feet, sending him falling, and then Ash dies. I guess the complete Ash Ketchum journey ends here. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to... Uh, Never mind, a Ash is saved. We can carry on. Now they decide to make it to their meeting point where Ryalu will be given from Jay to the client and just look at this shady dude. I hope we get to take him out. Oh, we do. This is great. The secret rich evil client dude here ends up hiding while his Pokemon help him do so. But you don't mess with the Pokemon Rangers, especially if Ash Ketchum and company are involved. Or if Lance decides to show up since aside from the Rangers helping out, there are also G-Men in the world of Pokemon that operate on a more spy and informational gathering level, but still will help Pokemon and take down some baddies if need be. Uh, he doesn't show up though. There's also the international police with someone like Looker, who first starts showing up a few times throughout the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl era, but he's not involved here either. Ryalu is retrieved in the end, and now Jay gets a new mission to go on and leaves once more. Curse you, Hunter Jay. We will get to the bottom of your crimes one day, or you will get to the bottom of a lake that's foreshadowing. But for now, Ryalu ends up okay. The client and his henchmen are arrested, and Ash has some communication with the Ryalu through their war abilities. It's always a fun time when we're with the Pokemon Rangers, but we must continue on for now, which is where we run into Sho, a trainer that has a love for the Pikachu line, but only has a Pichu and a Raichu. What a conundrum. Offering Ash a slew of electric Pokemon for trade, but Ash would never trade Pikachu in a million years. His Apom, sure, any time, but not Pikachu. They end up having a battle with Pikachu facing off against his Raichu, as skill-wise and moveset-wise, they are pretty evenly matched with this Raichu also knowing Iron Tail. But thanks to being larger and a bit faster, Raichu is able to pin down Pikachu to deliver a Hyper Beam at close range, having 100% accuracy. Ash, now not worried about winning or losing, only cares about Pikachu being okay from this. And right here, at this lowest point for Ash right now, it's the perfect time for Paul to show up and call Ash pathetic. Thanks, Paul. See you, see you later. We then get a chance to bring up those old conversations again, where in the original show, Pikachu had a moment of deciding that he didn't want to evolve into a Raichu thanks to the Thunderstone being an option for him. Oh, and before Paul leaves, he tells Ash that to be equal in that battle with the Raichu, he should just evolve his Pikachu. But it's not Ash's decision to make, it's Pikachu's, but he's not doing too well, giving us this emotional flashback and sad music as they do what they can do to help him at the Pokemon Center. Thankfully, Pikachu ends up waking up and all is okay. He actually wants to go get his revenge on Raichu right then and there, but Ash holds him back to make sure he gets his rest, having a talk with Pikachu again about the Thunderstone, showing that he has still had it this whole time since then. So Ash gives Pikachu the decision once more, leaving the Thunderstone with him in his room. We get Team Rocket seeing this once again, and having the discussion about something being off with Pikachu, evolving into a Raichu. Always having this weird protective care from afar with Pikachu, but still trying to steal him basically any other time? Pikachu struggles with his own thoughts alone, knowing he's been here before and not sure what the right answer is. Maybe what it should be, what it could be, but for him in the end, he decides against it. And when the others decide to check in on Pikachu, he is gone as well as the Thunderstone is gone, freaking everyone out as they all rush out to search for him. When Ash finds Pikachu, he went out to train on his own in the forest, performing his moves stronger than ever. And Ash is happy to see that it's still his old pal Pikachu and not Raichu. Team Rocket ends up taking the Thunderstone, one, for them to sell, but two, so Pikachu isn't in that position again, but who knows? We still have half the generation of Ash's journey to cover here, and this storyline has happened twice here in almost the exact same fashion. Ash now has a chance to battle Show once more, and the two electric mouses go at it again, now with Pikachu giving Raichu a lot harder of a fight, still having a similar moveset to counter. But Pikachu starts sending in powerful attacks together, having his vault tackle mixing with his iron tail to really get to Raichu. And now when the hyper beams are out to play, Pikachu uses his agility and strength to draw energy from that attack, allowing for a strong direct hit with an iron tail onto Raichu, knocking it out as Ash wins the battle. He ended up throwing some of Don's strategies in the mix for Pikachu to move around and have more power in his attacks, as Dawn is happy to see that something she worked on herself actually helped Ash in his battle strategies, showing just how much she has grown on her journey so far, and that she deserves to have the confidence that she built and rebuilt for herself. As I'd like to point out, a lot of what
what I'm leaving out of this video is Don's story. Rather than Don really being a companion here, Don is a main character who has a complete focus and full on arc in this series, where I'd say almost an equal amount of time is spent on Don as it is to Ash. But again, this is Ash's story, not Don's. Maybe we'll revisit other things to talk about at some other point. But for now, Sho and Ash part ways after a level of mutual respect is given with a rematch promise for some time in the future, if and when their paths ever cross. We then get a surprise appearance of Wallace, who is a Pokemon champion from the Hoenn League and is hosting this special Wallace Cup contest. And along with Don, Ash will be entering in the Wallace Cup as Wallace himself tells Ash to compete in it with his Buizel. But the real surprise this episode is at the end, when Ash received a message from someone at the Pokemon Center in Snow Point City. When he calls in, it turns out to be none other than the return of his Hoenn traveling buddy, May. She then arrives at the lake to meet up with Ash and the others as we see her with a slightly new look, giving her the Emerald version vibes. As she is excited to see her old friends and meet Dawn, giving them some presents as they all reunite. Max didn't come on this journey to Sinnoh as he's back home following in Brock's footsteps about caring for Pokemon, helping his dad out at the gym, as May has just been traveling, training, and competing. She also shows off that she was training her Eevee up in the north in Sinnoh, where an ice rock evolved her Eevee into a Glaceon. We just get to spend some time between May and the group catching up and showing that the friendship is still there and as strong as ever, with May bringing up if Ash still has that half of the terracotta ribbon that they shared the win of last series, and he does, as they hold both up as it acted as a lucky charm for May. Dawn has a ribbon from her mom as her lucky charm, as these three are all going into the Wallace Cup to give it their all. I think it's just a nice, wholesome moment there. Now, the outfits in this competition here are great. I just love how swaggy Ash gets right here. Look at him. All of the usual players are here as well, meaning Zoe and Jesse, I mean Jessalina. And after the performance stage showing off that Ash and Buizel are working together well, at least enough to impress the judges, and that Don makes a nervous but still impressive display with Ambipom to make it to the next round with the others, as now the battle stage is ready to begin. During the break before this, Ash ends up taking a walk around the lake at night, having an overall great experience being a part of the contest in general, as Ash and Pikachu notice something going on in the lake, seeing some form of mysterious Pokemon, as this would be another lake guardian like Don saw with this being Azelf. Ash runs to speak with the others and Don brings up her sighting from the start of the series and that May and Zoe know a lot about the legend of the lake up in the snow point area having its own mysterious Pokemon spirit as well. Again, there are three lake guardians and that marks two of them. So maybe that third lake that they're talking about maybe has, uh, I don't know, another one. This is all in favor of building out the lore a lot more as the Sinnoh region has always felt so special to the world of Pokemon, being the generation that brought in the god Pokemon, having the creation of Pokemon being set up, and even when we go into the far past of the region, seeing how it all plays into the larger picture of things, thanks to the Legend Arceus game and then the anime special that we'll talk about way later down the road. But enough of that for now, we have some battling to get to as Ash ends up defeating a Kecleon in his first round of battles, but loses in the second round due to time running out and having less points than his opponent Kai and his lantern, knocking him out of the Wallace Cup. Although he does get complimented during a post-battle interview over his work with Buizel, and Wallace seems happy with the performance as well. By the end of the day, Don, May, and Zoe, along with Kyle, are going into the semifinals with Don having to face Kyle and May going up against Zoe. But no matter what, the girls together make it a fun time, each of them promising to give it their all. The next set of battles result in Don taking out Kyle and May taking out Zoe, leaving the final matchup for the win between a Generation 3 and Generation 4 side protagonist, Don versus May. So the matchup itself is exciting, with Piplup going up against Glaceon for a grand battle that ends in time running out, and by only 0.5 points, Don ends up defeating May to take the win for the Wallace Cup. It's a massive deal for her, as her last few contests didn't end well, and after some soul searching and training, she was able to go toe to toe and win against May, who is way more experienced in the contest field. May ends up departing from here, saying her goodbyes to her friends, new and old, as our group in Sinnoh continue forward. And it's been long enough, I guess, so here's Paul once more and Ash is ready to battle this dude. They exchange their verbal disagreements with each other once more, and when the battle starts, Ash sends out his Gligar, the one that he's been heavily training to go up against Paul's Gliscor. If only we could have seen this coming. And yeah, Gligar gets knocked out by its more powerful evolution. But Ash lets him hang out and watch and cheer for the battle. Paul sends out that Ursaring he caught as Ash sends out Paul's old Chimchar, who wanted to step into this fight, regardless of if anyone thinks that he is ready emotionally to do so. But this intense battle results in Chimchar reaching that 
level Paul always wanted him to unlock again, getting his Blaze ability to show up, pulsing power throughout him. Paul knew that Chimchar could get back to this powerful state, and Chimchar ends up taking out the Ursaring, but at the cost of not being able to calm back down. The rage, the pain, the sadness Chimchar feels towards Paul has taken over him completely, as he goes to then just directly attack Paul. So the group pitches in to try and calm the fire monkey down, but in the end, only Ash can get through to Chimchar, going in for a hug to restrain him and enduring the heat and power, crying out for Chimchar to come back to himself, which eventually works and he is back to his normal Chimchar self. Then we have this moment of Chimchar thinking that he was in trouble, viewing Ash's yelling that was trying to get through to him as Ash being angry with him, when it was Ash just trying to get his voice to be louder than the angry voice inside of Chimchar, assuring the little guy that he is super powerful. Paul is curious about how Ash will combat this in the future, but Ash doesn't show any worry. He knows Chimchar will be able to harness that power he has in a way that doesn't come off as an outburst. Their battle, though, doesn't continue. Paul dismisses Ash's confidence in training Chimchar, and if there is a chance that he somehow is able to conquer the Blaze ability issue, that's when the two will face off against each other once more, as anything else he sees as a waste of time. Moments like this are pretty important to showcase the talent Ash has as a trainer thus far, learning to communicate with his Pokemon on a deeper level and help them find their own strengths in a natural way, with a caring environment to do so. Chimchar is young and has a lot of power, but his mind is all over the place, trapped in this chokehold of his old trainer and his brutal training ways, and how he needs to work with Ash and be better than letting Paul get to him like this. Now, as we go on, we end up in Pistoria City, where right away we meet Crasher Wake, the gym leader where before they can battle, he has some things to do but offers the group to come along with him. And once they get through this little side Krogunk competition thing, Crasher Wake is ready to battle Ash. Weasel really wants to win something here, not happy about the draw from the previous gym, so the training session is on before the match. Don even gives Ash a practice battle where Weasel, who wasn't even in this Pitplop versus Pikachu practice match, gets hit by a rogue lightning bolt and is pretty pissed off about this. So Ash steps in to get Weasel to not attack everyone over the accident. But it's time for the battle now and Crasher has a Floatzel on his team, the evolved version of Weasel, meaning there's some personal triumph Weasel wants here. First, Crasher sends out a Gyarados with Ash sending out Pikachu and oh boy, Pikachu has an energy about him right now, being able to take down Gyarados with nothing but strategy and from the training that he's been doing a lot of. Quagsire comes out now, so Ash switches to his Turtwig to face off against the GS Ball Stealer, but Turtwig takes quite a beating. So before being fully finished off, Ash called back Turtwig and decided to send out Buizel who uses his Aqua Jet attack to combat the Ice Beam from Quagsire to hit right back at him to knock him out, with Floatzel coming out now to face off against Buizel. There is a clear power level difference here, leading all of the attacks towards the Floatzel to be minimal as Buizel is left in a bit of a daze and now confused from the barrage of attacks, being swapped out for Pikachu to fight here now, as even he is having a hard time facing the Floatzel. Buizel sees Pikachu pushing hard and decides that he's the one who needs to face this mountain of a challenge, not Pikachu. So he gets Ash to put him back in, getting a pokey high paw when Pikachu passes him, and goes in with full force. Because of this, he is able to get a surprise up close shot on Floatzel, knocking him out and leaving Ash and Buizel the winner, where Ash earns his fourth badge, the Fen Badge, while Pikachu and Buizel have a moment to work things out from the training incident from earlier. We get to meet up with Gary again, as he helps Ash train his Gligar, and at one point offers Ash a Razor Fang, an item that can evolve Gligar as Gary goes on to mention that it will help give him the strength to better master these moves. And of course, Gligar wants all that comes with that offer, but Ash is hesitant, telling Gligar to wait a moment, going into this type of decision being a big one, and that training hard and working for it is not going to be replaced by evolving. But then by battling Team Rocket, where Gligar ends up being able to grow a lot stronger and help save the day, Ash gives him the chance to make the decision. And since Team Rocket still comes back for more, to save Ash, Gligar grabs the Fang and evolves into Gliscor and catches him. And the day gets saved once again. Through their relationship and time training together, Ash and Gliscor are becoming more powerful, proving that Ash's methods and sentiments about every Pokemon having the ability to become strong through friendship and training that doesn't push past a certain line can work. And Gary is just so wholesome now, calling Ash the hero in this situation. And they part ways again for now. When going back to Heart Home City, the gym leader still isn't around. So Don and Ash end up in the Heart Home collection. 
where it's all about style. Ash uh, surely did try here, but in the end, Don wins and even gets offered for their style and collection to get going with Pokey Chick Magazine. But this was just for fun. Her heart is set on the contest for being a coordinator. And since this whole series has the most amount of in-depth exploration of side quests to go on, here's another one where the group enroll in this one week long training camp called the Pokemon Summer Academy. It's a fun little several episode arc, but it feels so filler-esque in a time where there is already so much time spent between gyms just going and doing other things or competing in contests. Just a lot of not moving the plot anywhere of this season. And for the end of this camp, the people there compete in a triathlon that Ash ends up winning, so that was fun. After this, we finally meet Fantina, the gym leader for the Heart Home Gym. But for now, there's only room for a random contest battle with Zoe in an unofficial battle with Ash, where she just keeps putting his Pokemon to sleep, and Ash calls the match, giving him some knowledge to come up with a plan before their real battle. Team Galactic hasn't been around in a while, so they go in for another orb steal as Ash and company link back up with Cynthia and meet Professor Carolina, who runs the Celestic Town Historical Research Center as a businessman playboy philanthropist named Cyrus is heading towards the building. Team Galactic is keeping an eye on this though, noticing Ash from their last encounter as they get ready to pull off something. We get to learn more lore about Palkia, Dialga, and even the Lake Guardians, with Cynthia going into the meaning of the two spirits that they've seen so far, with Mesprit having the meaning of emotion and Azelf having the meaning of willpower. And for the one they haven't seen yet, Uxie, has a meaning of knowledge. With Cyrus now there, he pushes for Ash and Dawn to be shown the other orb in connection to all of the Dialga and Palkia lore, as Team Galactic are sneaking around setting up some sort of attack, seemingly waiting for that right special moment. Once the orb is less protected and shown, and Cyrus starts acting aggressively towards Ash and Dawn, when they don't really feel anything while being around the orb, Mars, another commander, sets off planted explosions, getting everyone to panic and for Cynthia to work with Ash to protect the orb and get it out of there. But in the end, Team Galactic ends up taking possession of the second orb and getting away while Cynthia now has to go have a battle for someone who's looking for the title of Pokemon Champion, which she must go attend, and leaves as we also get the reveal that this Cyrus guy, yeah, well, he's actually the leader of Team Galactic, unbeknownst to our heroes though. And that now their plan is simple. They collect the Lake Guardians, and Cyrus's big plan with Team Galactic is starting to fully come together. With his love and obsession regarding the creation of time and space, the origins of it all, truly driving his actions here. On a cooldown from that, the group meets Eren, another Elite Four member in Sinnoh who is on his way to battle Cynthia for the title. The world just feels so lived in when you can randomly come across interesting people like this just going about their own journey, but he loses to Cynthia, so that sucks for him. But look, Paul is back, and he's won a Relic Badge, meaning that Fantina is back at the gym so Ash can officially battle her. Also, somehow, Ash convinces Paul to battle regardless of what he said last time, but I do like how Brock tries having a conversation with him beforehand about his brother Reggie as we learn that he never won that Final Frontier badge when he lost at the Pyramid, which is when Reggie gave up being a trainer, with Paul shading his brother's decisions and wanting to be a better trainer than he ever was. The one-on-one -on -one battle between Paul and Ash has his Turtwig go up against Paul's Honchcrow, who ends up really getting Turtwig weakened, but through his strength and perseverance, Turtwig evolves into a Grottle, but even in the end, still loses. After a Pokemon Center visit, Paul's Torterra ends up outside waiting for them, and he then helps teach the newly evolved Grottle how to handle having a slower speed as he gets bigger and heavier through their evolutions. And after, when Paul is coming back around, Torterra leaves, making this whole thing a bit weird, but there is no time to dig into that, until he sees him the next day and thanks him for what his Torterra did, and Paul acts like he had nothing to do with it and walks away, with Ash looking forward to their next battle, claiming that that's the one that he'll win. We end up meeting Barry, who doesn't leave the best first impression on our group here, as Ash gets really fired up to battle him, and Ash's Chimchar ends up taking out Barry's star after right off the bat, but ends up getting knocked out when facing off against his Roserade, as Gliscor comes out to get revenge on that Roserade, but they're both knocked out as a result of them clashing, leaving us with Ash sending out Pikachu and Barry sending out Empoleon, to end off in a defeat for Barry thanks to Pikachu's Volt Tackle finishing off the Empoleon. Barry just thinks that Ash got lucky and that there's no way he could have lost to him. Well, you better believe it, Barry Bucko. But now for his battle with Fantina, he spent time setting up a strategy, a new technique, if you will. One that can help him against his Pokemon being put to sleep by her Pokemon, calling this new idea the Counter Shield Tactic. 
so when the battle begins, he can actually stand a chance here, as Barry also watches from the sidelines. First, Gengar comes out going up against Ash's Buizel, showing off the counter shield in action when combining the spin maneuver learned from Don with certain attacks. In this case here, a water pulse, creating a way to shield the Pokemon from the hypnosis and creating a set of water-like whips around Gengar, with Buizel winning the first round, eventually knocking out the Gengar. Next, she sends out Miss Magius, as Ash sends out his Chimchar, who, through the technique of the counter shield being used again, and combines the use of that fire element shooting all around, and by the end, Chimchar sticks a knockout, giving Ash the win again for that round. But for the final round, she sends out Driftblim, as Pikachu comes out to face it, and once again, the power of the counter shield works, with basically any typing, having Pikachu use it with his electricity, but Driftblim is extremely powerful, as Fantina quickly develops a counter-counter shield strategy that ends up taking out Pikachu, then Buizel, with only Chimchar left able to clutch this, but Chimchar channels all that he can, relying on his speed in the end to land a direct flamethrower attack to finish the Drift Limb off, giving Ash the win for the whole match and earning his fifth badge, the Relic Badge. Barry even sees him as a real rival to focus on going forward. And in the end for this season of Pokemon, the group reached the Canelave Gym, but the gym leader isn't around at the moment as he is training. But there is something off in this area regarding sleepless nights and the constant nightmares, as we see this is a struggle between Darkrai causing the nightmares and Cresselia protecting all from that. So at least we get to see Darkrai again outside of the movie, and through this the group help make sure Cresselia can ward off the Darkrai as Ash gets to training for the next gym battle. Which will happen next season as that is it for D DP Battle Dimension. So before we continue on with the next season, it's time for another movie break, as we get into some shamanigans. Get it? Because the next movie's about shaman and... Alright, moving on. So, this is a pretty unique movie on our mentioning and slight detailing of adventures throughout the films, as this is a sequel to the previous movie, with Giratina and the Sky Warrior picking up where things left off, bringing in the lore of two more Pokemon. The Reverse World was an alternate dimension created thanks to the Battle of Dialga and Palkia as Giratina resides within there now, causing issues between this dark dimensional beast in its origin form or not, that was being forced in there by Dialga when trying to escape from it. Shaman, a mythical Pokemon that can either look like this cute little bit of shrubbery, or some sort of fusion of a My Little Pony and a Paw Patrol dog, may be the only key to freeing the beast while a person named Zero works on his goal of entering into the reverse world to go after Giratina and drain its powers for himself. And where does Ash and his friends fit into all of this? Well, they're just kind of there again, which works with the majority of the plots for Pokemon films to keep it as little consequential as possible. In fact, if at all for the sake of the show's continuity. That's why, again, nothing major ever happens in these movies going forward, enough so that Ash has an actual change in character that we need to truly detail. There's little bits here and there. We already know that he likes to be a hero, so he helps in these situations. It's just rare that these ever make a difference to the character. We know the plight of Giratina here in the film, as Shaman's journey is just them wanting to be played in this flower garden. It's two extreme extremes. An incredible dark and edgier looking monster wanting to leave what essentially is an otherworldly prison, and a cute little thing that is adorable and wants flowers around. But inside every shaman is two beasts fighting to get out, where shaman in regular form is pretty obnoxious and sarcastic, but in a very entertaining way. The sky form brings out the over the top, the hero is here attitude, that can also be obnoxious or annoying, but in an entertaining way. The reverse world is a unique setting as it it twists and distorts captured anomalies and thanks to Dialga and Palkia's fight, things sure got busy in there. But the scientist traveling with Ash and company named Newton who studies this stuff helps fill in the missing gaps, especially the reason why Palkia and Dialga were fighting in the first place in the last movie, which was a misunderstanding of their territories being threatened by one another. Zero used to study under Newton and eventually he became too obsessed over the fact of a dimension that he can rule and so far a lot of this just sounds too familiar of a mix between other characters in the proper show that we'll get to, with how their stories play out and how the game handles similar moments. But the film spends time developing that while Giratina is perceived as bad and an antagonist, Zero is the one who is trying to capture him for his energy, which would kill the beast. 
But we reach a point where Giratina gets cared for and brought back to health thanks to Shaman, with him now finally not being portrayed as the most evil thing in the room, and Zero has this whole second layer to his new Dimension World Order that would eliminate the real world to protect himself and his new Dimension. Look, he has an interesting plan and some cool ways of doing things that are comparable to past iconic villains before him, but he loses his own identity because of it, rather than standing out more so to be unique, pulling in character traits from this bad guy here or this plot point here from another movie, just making an amalgamation of a bad guy. Of course, things end well with Giratina free and now off to look for Dialga, I'm sure just to talk in a friendly way. Shaman just gets to live this magical fairy-esque little hero that could life, and it's all thanks to the power of a certain flower in the flower garden. And totally not any help from our group here, and regardless if there was or not, there was. Regular form Shaman would claim otherwise. For the time being, the world is safe from these dimensional problems, at least in the movie world for all of this. For this entry, I thought it was cool to build upon the last one, bringing in the reaction to what happened last time where Giratina now has to deal with the consequences of a messed up world to live in and be punished to stay there thanks to a time loop that only Shaman can somehow fix thanks to its abilities. It's a decent enough setup to build off the back of the other and naturally introduce something so demonic and otherworldly to the series. I also want to note that I am a huge fan of this film visually, as the distorted looks of the city build around this awesome awesome landscape. It just adds in this look like no other part of Pokemon has had yet, even when we've had some trippier visual moments before. You just feel the scope of the world or dimension as we get to be in there with a larger than life Pokemon dispute to deal with and I guess be a part of as gravity has its own rules here in different areas in what feels like a world that never stays the same, morphing to adjust and form new fantastical looking creations. The fact that they tangle with reactions happening between the worlds gives a cause and effect feel where the outside world does feel threatened by this dimension. And I think that does add some good stakes to everything. It's a fun time and it's cool that it adds adds on to the last movie. But the real journey must continue forward with Ash, Brock, and Don moving along as if this never happened. Who's that Pokemon? It's Magikarp! Gar -gar. And speaking of stakes, it looks like those are also going to rise for this next season here titled DP Galactic Battles. Ash has continued on his training, getting his Pokemon in their best shape yet as we finally meet Byron, the gym leader for Canalave City, and hey, he's also the father to the first gym leader, Rourke. The battle officially begins with Chimchar facing off against Bronzor, and Chimchar nearly edges out the win here, leaving Ash with the counted win but recalls him because he needs a rest for sure. Next to battle is Steelix, and Buizel is ready to face the beast. And thanks to the sheer strength and power of the Steelix, Weasel gets defeated, with Chimchar jumping out next. Chimchar holds his own and is able to land a solid strike to finish what Buizel started, but now Bastidon comes out, as Ash has to think back to the first gym battle that he had, focusing on what he did to take down Rourke's Rampardos, but Chimchar was too drained to win the battle and gets knocked out, as Ash relies on one more Pokemon and that's his Gliscor, who escapes getting pulverized and lands a nice win knocking out the Bastidon, as Ash now wins his sixth badge, the Mind Badge. Before heading to get his next badge though, the group head over to Iron Island after speaking with Barry and hearing that for some reason Pokemon are becoming violent. Once there, the group meet Riley and his Lucario who, wait a minute, why is this character design and coincidence of him having Lucario look so similar to, hmm, odd. They all end up working together to investigate and solve whatever is going on, as we find out that Team Galactic are here under the Commander Mars, as they are trying to find everything that leads to the past through the Pokemon of Creation Legend, where here they found ruins and ancient etchings that, thanks to the key that she has, shoots out a beaming light that directly affects Mount Coronet, getting the information that the Spear Pillar location may be somewhere on the mountain. The longer the beam is up, the more time that they have to scan for that pillar, but when Ash and company interfere and stop it early, the pillar ends up not being located, but the margin to search now is only 40% of the mountain, as they retreat with this info that is gathered, as well as that key once more. But the mystery of how all of this is connected continues to be looked at, by the constant side characters that we run into, and by Ash and his friends whenever they happen to randomly pass by some evil Team Galactic stuff happening. But do you remember last generation we went over the Pokey Ringer contest that's all about the aviary competitions? Well, it happens again. This time it's Ash versus James again, as well as Paul, 
and it's a repeat of last time, almost perfectly, as Ash would end up winning this again and his bird Pokemon would evolve. Last time his Talo to a Swellow, and here with his Staravia evolving into a Staraptor. Honestly, with how good Ash is with flying Pokemon, he should just follow this as a career path, he just doesn't miss. And he gets to put it in Paul's face that this little old weak Starly from the start did grow and become this strong Staraptor with a level of skill brought out by its teamwork with Ash. We also get a random mini arc for the few episodes that's all about a ping pong tournament that gets all built up and as weird as this aside was, and not for the fact that they all lose this, a big moment happens with Ambipom, who ends up loving ping pong so much and has what it takes to become a ping pong champion. So, after everyone makes up their mind about this, Ambipom ends up going with this one character over here who takes him back to Vermilion City in the Kanto region to train in ping pong. Well, I guess that abruptly ends Ambipom's story, or at least for now, but I am happy that she found something that she truly loved. I thought we were focusing on the contest stuff with Ambipom, but no, ping pong, that's sure, that's fine. Well, eventually, Ash and company make it to Snowpoint City as Ash gets ready to fight the seventh gym leader, Candace. So my only question is, can this dude pull off a win the first time around? Maybe. They start off with Ash's Grottle taking on her Sneasel, and despite the odds, Grottle uses some of the tips that Paul's Torterra was teaching it, proving that those strategies worked by taking out the Sneasel in the end. So there's a little bit of Paul's tactics being used here. Interesting. Ash then swaps out for Staraptor for the advantage against Candace sending out a Metacham. And Staraptor, of course, clutches this one after some small struggle, being swapped out for his Gliscor once she sends out her Snover. And it proves to be too much to handle for the Gliscor, landing a bunch of bullet seed hits and not knocking Gliscor out. Chimchar comes out next to heat up the temp as Snover gets taken out quickly, but she sends in her last effort to win, an Obama Snow. Ash quickly swaps out Chimchar when things look too rough and has Star Raptor come right back out, only to go right back in thanks to being knocked out, giving Ash the full understanding of the power this Pokemon has. Grottle comes out and also gets defeated, so that seemed like a waste of time because Chimchar comes right back out, right where we started, and oh boy, Chimchar puts up one heck of a fight as he fully gets gets into a groove here with Ash about what to do next as they power through and is still standing after knocking Obama Snow out. And Ash is officially declared as the winner and awarded the Icicle Badge. Then Paul comes in for a gym battle, but more interesting than that is that we start getting more Paul lore as Reggie comes around as well. Then all of a sudden, before the gym battle, the Battle Pyramid from the Battle Frontier appears as Ash makes note of defeating the brain there and winning the symbol as Paul reacts to it in shock. And now we all go and worry about the battle pyramid, as again, Reggie is well decorated in badges and in the frontier symbols minus the final one from this pyramid. As he said, that day he realized he had a lot to learn and switched his whole career path. When they meet up with Brandon, the frontier brain, we waste no time before Paul snaps out of his own mind and challenges Brandon to a battle. He wants to finish what his brother couldn't, and if Ash could do it, that means he could do it too, and take him down as that day that his brother lost so bad that he stopped battling, Paul truly became the way he is, doing whatever he can to make the strongest Pokemon team out there, and of course, you know, you defeat this guy. That's on his list. Paul loses, though, and as a side adventure with Brandon begins, as he looks for another Reggie, no, not that Reggie, another Reggie Pokemon, Paul gets offered to have a battle in 10 days with Ash, so there is something to look forward to. Reggie really wants to see these two go at it to give each other the fair shake full battle that they've been teasing the whole time. So the side story brings us to a plot point that involves Pokemon Hunter J again, as thanks to her, the fourth Reggie, Reggie Gigas, is awakened. Brandon deals with this like usual, and wow, 10 days have already passed by. As yes, it's time for that big battle with Paul, Ash sends out his Buizel and Paul sends out his Torterra. And then Ash flips the script, recalling Buizel and sending out Gliscor, who is having a tough back and forth with Torterra, not doing so hot energy-wise, so then Ash recalls Gliscor to then send out Staraptor now. Torterra is pretty pretty beat, but Paul plays all or nothing for the experience purposes to overcome tough battles, but also for predicting Ash's plan of attack here, putting up a strong defense. But now Paul recalls it, sending out a Weavile as it jumps onto Staraptor's back but Staraptor turned out to be a better scrapper in close combat and ends up winning this battle, but needs to rest, so Ash switches out Pokemon again, with Paul putting out Electabuzz now and Ash putting out Grottle. And after a couple blows back and forth, Electabuzz gets swapped out for Honchkrow, who has such a fierce battle with Grottle that after plenty of fun action and strategy on both ends, Honchkrow lands the final blow, taking out Grottle with Ash sending in Pikachu to face Magmortar, the evolution of Magmar. One thing I like about Generation 4 is all the 
random evolutions that we got here. I feel like Generation 4 was like, okay, this Pokemon from Gen 1 gets an evolution, this Pokemon from Gen 2 gets an evolution, ah, eh, maybe a couple here from Generation 3 get an evolution. Have you seen a Probo Pass? What is, what is going on? I like it. What is happening here? This is a nice, a nice mustache. After seeing this Pokemon's power and how Pikachu was faring, Ash swaps in Buizel and then Paul ends up switching as well, and out comes Ursaring. And Buizel does great at first, but starts getting hurt pretty badly, but he doesn't want to be recalled. He wanted to finish this battle with Ursaring, but the bear ends up getting faster, being able to land a pretty big blow onto Buizel, who is now no longer able to battle. Ash is putting faith in his Pokemon in their action to battle harder if they want to keep going despite his normal judgment to swap when needed. As if they are not on the same wavelengths working together, then winning this battle would be nearly impossible. Ash sends out his Star After again, but Ursaring is still too powerful, taking out the Star After. He sends out Electabuzz once more as Ash throws in his Chimchar to battle, who's fired up to go against Paul, but Electabuzz was there just to put out a light screen for his next swap, which was, again, Torterra, as Chimchar would now have trouble getting in some attacks, so Ash swaps out for Gliscor, who gets knocked out instantly. Pikachu wants to be back in to give it a shot, but Torterra gets swapped out for Ursaring, and Paul's strategy here has fully confused Ash for what to do, ruining his strategies as Pikachu nearly ends up dead in a lake, and Ash sends out Chimchar as his last chance. And he ends up powering through the fight with Ursaring, getting him knocked out of the match as he starts to evolve and becomes Monferno, along with a powerful new move in Mach Punch. So Electabuzz comes out for a furious battle full of flying fist as Monferno's determination burns his fighting fire up a level in heat to face Electabuzz but in the end, Monferno faints, leaving Paul the victor in this match, with most of his Pokemon still all good for battle, and Ash out all six. Paul finally experiences some bit of joy in his life and is happy that he won, but does note that that battle was spectacular. So at least there's that. Oh, and then Ash does that thing where now he thinks he's not a good enough trainer to be worthy of competing in the Sinnoh League despite everything else that he's already done, but I'm sure things will be okay. You know, usually he does this multiple times in a season, but he's, he's been pretty good so far. So I'll let him slip a little bit. By the way, that whole battle took place on the third special lake in the area, and it gave Brock a chance to see something, as in the lake he ends up seeing Yuxi. So that's cool. But Team Galactic are still doing things with Saturn and Charon up at the mountain searching for the pillar, as Ash just gets in the way and gets involved like usual. And nothing to really see here, but we eventually meet Palmer, who is a frontier brain, but from the Sinnoh battle frontier. We also get this quick festival tournament where Ash beats Barry in the end, and he ends up winning this whole thing too, so that's kind of cool. Again, Ash is really good at winning random things. When it comes to league championships, not really. But you better believe if he has to tell a bird to fly, that bird will fly and win. But that win grants him a battle with Palmer, and Ash loses. It, he loses. But he still got his trophy, so I guess it doesn't matter. Dawn gets this egg after defeating this trainer named Lyra, who is with this dude named Cory, who are from the Johto region, so the egg hatches into a Cyndaquil, while the two end up joining the group for a bit. The Cyndaquil has its first battle ever with Ash's Grottle, although it was stopped at a certain point to give the newborn Pokemon a rest from the experienced Pokemon. Later on, the two have a tag battle against Ash and Dawn, where Ash and Dawn take the win, and they end up saying goodbye to these two Johto travelers as they part ways. And that's another point that I really like about the series as they go on. Whether it be in the third generation or now here in the fourth generation, they aren't scared to just add companions for several episodes. Where it may seem that there's a lot of characters to focus on, but it just makes the journey that much cooler. I like these little moments. Team Galactic ends up completing their red chain which is a special device, and they have found their way to the Spear Pillar. So Ash and company have to get in the way like usual to stop this whole whatever it is thing that they're planning. And there's another commander around named Jupiter. You know, I also really like the names. They're just so on brand for the team and I am here for it. Pokemon Hunter J returns again, this time working for Cyrus to go and capture the Lake Guardians. Cynthia comes back around, but her presence doesn't scare away the bad guys like it should because J already has finished capturing the targets, but they prove to be a powerful handful, causing J's ship to break open and sink down to the depths of the water. And I, I just, I think they're dead. I think they're all dead. H how would you survive this? We, we just witnessed something here, and I'm not saying nothing. But I would have wanted to learn the answers as to who Pokemon Hunter J truly was. She doesn't come back from this, by the way. I want to make that clear. But luckily for Ash and his friends, he gets some help from the Lake Guardians to be put in the Team Galactic home base, and now learning that Cyrus was really the leader here, and yeah, that was so last season, guys, keep up. Now, nothing stops him from summoning Dialga and Palkia, as he has everything needed to begin, appearing at the pillars with the orbs and the Lake Guardians captured. Now, using Using the red chain to force the three Pokemon to power up the orbs, bringing forth Dialga and Palkia as two dimensional portals begin to appear 
with both respective Pokemon coming forth, only to be captured and held by the Red Chain. But Ash and company get the Lake Guardians free, pushing back the two legendary space and time creatures into their dimensions. But don't worry, Cyrus had a backup plan. You don't get this far and not have one. So using more power from the Red Chain, the two Pokemon appear once more, this time to their full extent. The Guardians ask Ash and everyone to help them by setting free Dialga and Palkia, as Cyrus has them using their different abilities to create a portal to a different dimension that would essentially grow and replace the world around it as Cyrus wants to have this whole new world to himself, ditching his team under him. Specifically the commanders as when the legendary Pokemon are set free from their hold, the portal begins to disappear and Cyrus goes through, as then the portal fades away but things are fine, just Dialga and Palkia still being mad and creating a black hole threatening all life itself once again, nothing big. But thanks to the Lake Guardians and our heroes here, they are calmed down and nicely returned home to their dimensions, as Ash, Dawn, and Brock become became the perfect vessels to be marked in aiding the Guardians in this moment because their friendships and bonds as a group are really strong. So Sinnoh is saved, Cyrus is probably dead, and Team Galactic is no more, with the commanders all getting arrested. Also, here's a shout out to another moment with Jezebel returning and trying to marry James once more, which is just a nice little random callback I wanted to do to the episode in the original series. We see Paul again, and he has won all eight badges and is qualified for the Sinnoh League Conference. So Ash needs to uh get a move on it here, but he doesn't really. Instead, he comes across a gibble and tries to help Help it learn this dragon attack, Draco Meteor, as Gibble then follows the group around until Gibble wants to be caught, and instead of letting it just happen, he's just eating the Pokeballs. And then he eats Barry's bike. You know, this bike trope really affects so many people in this franchise. Eventually, Gibble is captured, but used in battle against Barry and loses pretty badly to his Empoleon. Yeah, well, that's going to wrap up this season of the Diamond and Pearl era, and we aren't done yet. This is such a packed era with so much happening, and we've only really focused on Ash. Imagine if we also covered all of what Dawn was going through. This video will be twice as long. Now we get a little treat of another Pokemon film before we get into the final season as Ash still has an eighth badge to go get. Okay, so you know how the last movie was a sequel to the movie before it? What if there was a, a part three? And Pokemon made a secret trilogy here, as we now get to take a brief look at Arceus and the Jewel of Life, a film that would bring the creation Pokemon to life in front of our eyes, and more importantly, Ash and company's eyes, regardless of what they'll ever claim to remember or not. And this one is a pretty big jump in the crazy stuff that happens here, as parts one and two to this trilogy were already quite a lot to handle, mixing genres and having darker visuals. It was a fun time, but here, Ash and friends find themselves in the middle of everything once again. We get to look into the Pokemon that created everything, the god figure in Pokemon himself, Arceus, who trusted mankind once to replenish the world, but is tricked by the humans, or so we think, leaving the jewel of life unreturned, so now a rage-filled Arceus threatens revenge on them and their world for this betrayal, leaving more of its creations in the form of Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina to be the ones to calm the all-powerful being or try and take it down if they have to. So the logical thing to happen does, and the gang gets sent back in time to fix whatever happened in the past to stop the god in modern day. Now let's not get all time travel technical here and ignore if it's plausible because if the show that we are watching makes it a rule for how it works within that narrative, then we just have to take it for what it is, okay? But first off, yes, Giratina did fly off to go battle Dialga for trapping it in that dimension, but their feud comes to a halt once there are other pressing matters, like, a, I don't know, an angry god. Sheena and Kevin are in the mix here with our group as Sheena has some cool magical Pokemon spirit connecting powers. As we build up to Arceus's return after a thousand years of slumber, ready to strike through the pain of being deceived. The main battle between the four Pokemon is on an epic scale that is really flashy, but mainly it's just a lot of these big beams filled with surrounding gust flying back and forth. But when we focus on the stuff that takes place in the past once they travel back, it genuinely piques a curiosity itch regarding the way Pokemon were looked at back then. Not being treated well being an understatement to what that means, as these Pokemon essentially were servants to mankind, for full on strength in some ways, but mainly there to serve humans for whatever they need. So less like a fun relationship and more like forced servitude. It's a harsh time, but there's a lot of morality here to explore. There are some fun gimmicks of being in the past to play with, like things going a certain way, resulting in the disappearance of others fading in and out of reality. And it's a great time for everyone, unless you're one of the ones who are fading away. But the other aspect that makes the time traveling fun is the 
the options of taking out Arceus in the past. Making sure that the jewel is returned or never borrowed in the first place among other options can be a thing. But aside from that is the truth about the history, with the person who was claimed to have wronged Arceus named Damos not really the one at fault as he planned on giving the jewel back to the god Pokemon, but this other person named Marcus manipulated the situation. I mean, clearly he did. Look at this guy. That guy, that's the bad guy. It brings us down the exploration of what God is to man and what their relationship can be. Having the references to what is essentially sin, and therefore the relationship was from that day broken, but eventually it could be healed and patched. And these are some pretty intense thought-provoking concepts to explore, especially in a Pokemon movie. Again, this whole trilogy has been kind of this outlier in what we talk about here, and why I think that the Pokemon movies are still fun to talk about, because even going back to the first one, there's a lot of themes that relate to existentialism, and your destiny, and our connection to life, and all those living in it. And it's not to say that the series of Pokemon in general doesn't have those moments, it's just that the movies feel free to explore more of this or more interesting questions because the continuity here doesn't have to affect what happens in the show. We can explore stuff that literally blow your freaking mind, something you would never forget that can change your whole perception of thought. And then we go right back to the show when it's Ash getting ready for his next gym battle. And did I notice this kind of stuff as a kid watching this? No, not really. I just looked at the visuals. So I'm sure many just see a movie like this with fun Pokemon space gods fighting each other. But viewing it now, I think the parallels and connections here are pretty fun and just generally a cool topic to explore in Pokemon. A talking, all-powerful god that man has to reconcile with, as this evil character who wears red to let you know that they are bad ends up getting killed in a pretty painful and awful way. But that's what you get for tempting man against god, knowing good and well that until time travel got in the mix and people came back to figure things out, that it wouldn't be something you'd have to deal with, but the people a thousand years from now would. I do admire that Pokemon went forward with a separate narrative away from the show with this trilogy, continuing another story over here that isn't affecting the show, and the show, I guess, kind of doesn't affect the movies back, except who's traveling with the group at the time, but regardless, the trilogy altogether is alright. I think that there are some really cool moments in each release, but also I believe that they stop short of fully exploring the concepts to their limits, posing a lot of great questions, but giving kind of mild answers. But overall, with how all three movies tied in together, I still think it was pretty fun to watch and see unfold. Each movie works on their own as a complete story, so you can look at them like that, but it's kind of cool to have these three run a narrative through each other. And I really think the concept of a god Pokemon that is responsible for the creation of creation and every tier of creator underneath it to every living being underneath it is really cool. Arceus is a cool Pokemon from a design and ability perspective, but also a fun one to explore from a personality perspective, giving us a version of who Arceus can be and what it can do. It's personally fun in my opinion to explore that as much as we do here, as on the other medium side, mainly with the video games, we've gone down deep into that well. But all's well that ends well, with us now continuing the journey proper for the final season of the Diamond and Pearl era. Who's that Pokemon? Now we officially enter the end of the Diamond and Pearl era for the show with the final season called DP Sinnoh League Victors, and I sure hope that there are some victories to be had. It's been such a long era of stories. It would be nice to have some good payoffs here in this shorter season. I mean, Ash takes place in a Pokeathlon, and he ends up coming in second. He, he didn't win, and we just move along. When Barry comes back around, he's past Ash, having fully earned eight badges and qualified for the Sinnoh League. So Ash needs to train and get himself all eight badges badges as well. You know, that'd be nice. Maybe there's another Pokeathlon to go do or something. Maybe even another ping pong tournament, Ash. But Ash's Monferno gets set off and his Blaze ability takes over again, now more powerful and unstoppable than ever. But Ash jumps in to take on some direct damage and pain, but for the efforts of reminding Monferno about their promise of them training together, as Paul, who's here by the way, sees how much Ash truly is giving his old Pokemon that care that he deserved. But once in his right mind again, Monferno evolves into Infernape, with Paul Paul being impressed that Monferno held off the blaze that well and was able to control the power and energy surge to aid it in its evolution. Ash and friends end up getting to Sunny Shore City so Ash can face off against the final gym leader, with that being Volkner. But Ash first meets Flint, another Elite Four member for the Sinnoh region who has an Infernape. 
that's convenient. But Volkner is not in the mood to battle. He's down in the dumps and just offers the badge to Ash, but you know what? I'll give Ash some credit here. He refuses it. He decided not to take the badge and wants to earn it fair and square. So now in the meantime of that not happening right now, Flint has a battle with Ash, as his Infernape takes out Ash's Buizel pretty quickly, so Ash evens the playing field by sending out his, and we just get a fun battle here. Uh, it's, it's over. Oh, well. That buildup was for gosh darn nothing. Pikachu comes out now to try and fight the Infernape, and by the end of it all, Pikachu faints after giving it his all. So Flint wins, but hey, at least now Volkner is into battling again and agrees to battle with Ash for the badge. But who cares about that? Their battle gets cut off thanks to Team Rocket. This whole tower is a rocket ship, and Ash is screwed from battling for the badge because of the damages here. So it just feels that everything that we just experienced was for nothing. But sure, Grottle evolves into a Torterra, so there, there's that. The reason I'm so disappointed in all of that now stopping is that it all just feels so dragged out as we approach the end of the series here. Season 4 already has the shortest amount of episodes compared to the past three, and it feels like everything's just going to be condensed and squeezed down to in the end, when instead of just battling for the eighth badge, we have to go through another random battle, a whole Team Rocket thing, and then, uh-oh, now he can't battle for the badge. We just have to wait a long time now until we can come back and do so. It feels like progression becomes less of a focus while we get fake-out progression moments like this. Because you'll want to know what we do in the meantime until Ash comes back to face Volkner? Well, let's continue on and we'll see. Ash has a battle with another Sinnoh Elite 4 member as Bertha agrees to a battle, and her Hippodon ends up knocking out Ash's Torterra after displaying some impressive moves to Bertha, but Ash loses to yet another member of the Elite Four. From there, we go to another lakefront for the Sinnoh Grand Festival. For a bit, and after that several episode arc, Ash finally gets the information that he can go back to face Volkner again, and Don wears the cheerleading outfit once more to cheer him on. Volkner sends out an Electivire, with Ash sending out his Torterra, and poor Torterra not getting a win again, being knocked out pretty fast here. Pikachu comes out next, who ends up wearing out the Electivire, giving Pikachu an opening to land a solid Iron Tail, knocking him out, with Volkner sending out out Jolteon and Ash switching to Infernape, who is able to land some fast and strong attacks, ending with a mock punch to take out Jolteon, as Volkner is down to his last, sending out his Luxray, with Ash putting Pikachu back out. The Luxray, however, was too powerful and takes Pikachu out shortly after that, leaving Infernape to come back out and face this final challenge, and through this is shown to truly use his Blaze abilities in a way that can be controlled and harnessed, helping him power through the fight and knock out the Luxray, giving Ash the win and his final badge for the Sinnoh region, the Beacon Badge, but a Bacon Badge would have been nice. It took him long enough, but now he's just like Paul and Barry and qualifies for the championship. It's a month away, but I'm sure time will fly right by, as in the meantime they are already heading to where it will be held and come across Kenny again. So Ash faces him in battle and loses fairly fast before we continue to Lily of the Valley Island. And once there, they meet all of the familiar faces you would expect. And yes, that includes Nando, I'm glad you made it. Ash wants to play things differently for the league here, swapping around his team, while that all ends up going wrong thanks to Team Rocket and Professor Oak messing up which Pokemon he was sending over for Ash. But that's a fun scavenger hunt, go and find your missent and swapped around Pokemon. And I do mean that, it's a fun time because we get to see a bunch of returning Pokemon here get the spotlight in general because of this. Mainly seeing Bayleaf get excited to see Ash again, and doesn't want to stay in their ball, as well as Ash's Cyndaquil helping save the day and ends up evolving into a Quilava, and now knows the move Eruption. So Ash spends time with more of his older Pokemon here, giving us an array of friends returning for cameos or for use in the tournament as well. Hey, the month is over, the Sinnoh League Championship is about to start, and right off the bat, Ash will have to face Nando in the very first round of the tournament. Paul still thinks Ash is pathetic, but that doesn't stop Ash from being determined here, as when the battle starts, Nando sends out a Roserade, as Ash sends out Staraptor, who is able to take down the Roserade, but has a struggle with his Armaldo that would come out next knocking the bird out, and Ash sending out his Quilava. And during this battle, we start hearing rumors from Barry about some mysterious trainer that is in the tournament and has a dark Darkrai. But back to the match, Quilava puts up a little bit of a fight against Armaldo, just enough to knock him out, as he also got knocked out as well. Nando sends out his last Pokemon with it being Cricketoon, and Ash sends out his Heracross. And these big bugs beat the dirt off of each other until Heracross uses both Mega Horn and Horn Attack to knock out Cricketoon and win the first round as Nando thanks Ash for the battle and leaves. Now Ash wins this random second match with his Snorlax and prepares to battle in the third round against Conway, while Barry faces Paul. For that match, Paul wins. 
and that trainer with the dark rye is revealed as this person named Tobias. I'm sure he won't be a problem at some point at all. For Ash versus Conway, Conway sends out Shuckle. Well, Ash sends out his Noctowl, but you never underestimate a Shuckle is what I always say, as it does a great job of keeping Noctowl from staying in the sky, so Ash recalls him and sends out Donphan instead, who just gets recalled right away after being knocked aside, with Gibble coming out to play next, as Gibble performs that mastered Draco Meteor and defeats the Shuckle. Ash switches from Gibble to Noctowl again, who defeats the Licky Licky and in return gets knocked out by Conway's next Pokemon, Dusknoir. So Donphan is back and tries his best, but quickly is defeated by a Shadow Punch from the Ghost, leaving Gibble the last resort here to win the battle, as it lands a direct shot using Dragon Pulse to knock out the Dusknoir and win the third round of the tournament, which leaves Ash now having to face Paul in the next round, which excites Ash, who after making some party updates, the battle is ready to begin with Ash sending out Pikachu and Paul sending out Aggron. So a pretty powerful opponent Pokemon right at the start. And Pikachu is able to fend off Aggron for a bit before getting enough damage for Ash to say, okay, I need to swap out right now, and sends out Infernape instead pretty early on. Infernape seemed more ready than ever to battle, being able to swiftly and with a lot of power defeat the Aggron, as Paul brings out Gastrodon and Ash swaps to his Star Raptor, but couldn't pull off the certain strategies he knows that could work thanks to Gastrodon's skills. So he swaps again for Buizel, where Ash has to think on his feet quickly to help guide Buizel to a victory as he takes out the Gastrodon. So next, he sends out his Drapion. Again, Drapion's cool, like Drapion. And speed won't work here to get to a spot Drapion won't see an attack coming from thanks to its torso twisting abilities, making it hard for Buizel to land any attacks, faring too hard for him to win, as Drapion takes the W here. Ash sends out Star Raptor, who also falls victim to Drapion's power. So Ash goes even bigger, sending out his Torterra, who finally is able to show more of the power he possesses. But even in this important moment, he loses once again. To Drapion. He's just not letting up in this fight at all. Ash sends out Gliscor and Paul swaps for Ninjask, who gets to Gliscor pretty bad, so Ash recalls him and now uses Infernape once more, who slows down Ninjask's speed so he can hit it with a direct attack, knocking out the Pokemon with Ash recalling the Infernape again so he can rest. Next, Paul sends out Frostlass as Ash sends out Pikachu, who has to find a way to get through and stop Frostlass's hail so it can no longer be hidden in it, as Paul sees and recognizes Pikachu's skills as he manages to take out Frostlass and then be recalled to rest for the moment. Paul sends out Drapion again, with Ash sending out Gliscor, with the two holding strong against one another as we officially bring this battle to its third episode in length, with an impressive win from Gliscor against the Drapion, finally taking down the beast. Now Paul sends out his Electivire, who goes hard against Gliscor and squeezes out the last bit of energy it has, sadly ending up in it getting knocked out, with Pikachu returning to the fight for now. Pikachu has known this Pokemon for its whole evolutionary line, ending up with both having respect for one another that one time, so the battle is very much a blow-for-blow blow battle up until Pikachu ends up passing out and is unable to battle. But now the real rivalry that's still there comes out, with Infernape always having a power struggle with this Electivire going back to when they were just Elekid and Chimchar through Paul's extreme training ways. Two opponents with a lot of multiple experience in training, now split between two different training methods, who are now ready to duke it out. And all is well until Electivire tosses the hardest possible thunder, causing Infernape to collapse, but Electivire stops the judge from calling it there, knowing that Infernape has more fire in there and isn't done just yet, giving Infernape that moment to get up, showing that even in their rivalry, they respect one another. But Paul tries breaking him down further, thinking that he's just like Ash, pathetic, but Ash knows that the battle is never over until it's over, with Infernape harnessing the Blaze ability once again, finally bringing us the battle Paul has truly been wanting from Ash this whole time, with Electivire really pushing harder than ever now, but after a tense standstill following a massive attack from Infernape, Electivire feels the pain and passes out, making Infernape the winner of the bout and in that, the defeat of Paul on the grand stage for all to see. Infernape was able to face down Paul stronger than Paul ever saw him to be, Ash was able to prove that his methods bring the true results he promised and everyone in the crowd is excited to see this. Heck, Team Rocket gets emotional over this win here. Cynthia watched over this and notes that while they are very different trainers, their connection now has a bond that can't be broken. Ash calls out Paul before he leaves as Paul finally admits that Infernape is truly strong, as Ash appreciates the acknowledgement and growth on Paul's end. As the two end on a note of respect for one another, as Ash wants another battle in the future and even Paul waves goodbye. As he now 
heads out to find Brandon again to face him on his own for his story to continue, as Ash now moves on to the next round, having to face none other than Tobias and what mischief he has in store. So Ash must pull out all the stops that he can, with Tobias having that Darkrai out and ready first thing, with Ash sending out Heracross for the battle, but Darkrai demonstrates why it's been such a threat, taking Heracross out extremely quickly. But next we get another familiar face, Torkoal, who in good old Torkoal fashion sadly gets defeated as well, leaving Ash pretty nervous with this Darkrai. So Gibble comes out next, and that doesn't work out too well either, with Gibble's attacks getting dodged and it not being able to avoid Darkrai's. So Sceptile comes out next, which is a refreshing turn of events to see this powerhouse becoming the first Pokemon able to take out Darkrai yet, and it's just fun to see. Sceptile's a cool Pokemon, I like their relationship with Ash in the last generation, and it just defeated a Darkrai. Even Tobias seems to be impressed with Ash's training skills here. But now he shows off his next Pokemon in his unfair arsenal, because aside from already having a freaking Darkrai, which blows everyone watching's mind as it proceeds to take out Sceptile. But Ash is bringing back all of his old friends, so next comes out his other award-winning bird, Swellow. But they weren't fast or powerful enough to compare to Latios and gets taken out, bringing Ash to his final Pokemon, which turns out to be none other than Pikachu, as they are ready to battle to the end, no matter what the result turns out to be. In the end, Pikachu ends the match in style, going down fighting, with Latios feigning as well. So while Ash did bring down a second way above the power limit Pokemon here, he was out of all six, meaning that regardless, he still loses. While the others feel sad for Ash, it's actually pretty good for him, making it the first time he's ever cracked the top four in a league conference. And Brock notes how great Ash was here. Tobias ends up winning the whole thing, of course, because, well, do I even have to say it? The group head out from the ending ceremonies, all excited about their future. But what about Brock? Where are his passions right now? Is becoming a Pokemon breeder still in the cards? Is traveling with Ash still a thing he wants to do? Well, we get some insight to that as his happiny evolves into a Chansey, and he's been really helpful this season even more so acting as a help for Nurse Joy at any Pokemon Center. As here, we see him helping this Pichu, and Nurse Joy gives him the thought that he should become a Pokemon doctor as she thinks he'd be excellent at it. As their journey back to Twin Leaf is going on, Brock takes time to think about his future and if being a Pokemon doctor could be his true passion in life. We end the series the way we started, with Dawn waking up in her bed as they all spend the night at Dawn's house. Dawn gets some news and then decides that she will stay in Sinnoh thanks to getting a gig she accepts, this time for her Baneri, to be a model for the Pokechick magazine from earlier. So Ash and Brock say their heartfelt goodbyes to Dawn as they all have some interesting journeys ahead of them. When Ash and Brock are arriving back in Kanto, the two of them part ways once more, with Brock heading back to Pewter with the support of Ash for his doctor career path while he wishes Ash luck in becoming a Pokemon master, putting Ash on his own once again. As now he is overlooking his hometown of Pallet, as him and Pikachu excitedly run home for a break before they venture off into another region not long from now. But to give us some new Pokemon tease of something from the upcoming fifth generation, we have one more movie to talk about today, so let's get to that. Alrighty, it's time for our final movie to briefly talk about as we've already gone through a trilogy that has brought us to now get a film that brings in some new Generation 5 Pokemon for us to see outside of the proper generation of introduction. This is Zoroark Master of Illusions, and it brings in our group as they all head towards Crown City. But along the way, we meet a new Pokemon named Zora, who needs help since their mother Zoroark was captured by this Gring's Kodai fella. The plan here is simple, as if the guy can use Zoroark's illusion abilities correctly, he can stir up some issues or panic around the town because Kodai is a businessman with a plan and he also has the power to see the future. We just have to accept that there are random super abilities like this more and more often in the universe of Pokemon. I mean here we actually do learn how he gets them and that's from this moment of reaching into a time ripple left by a Celebi infusing him with the energy inside to give him these powers. Using it to become an influential businessman that is insanely wealthy and essentially controls the media narrative out there. Again lots of fun topics here in the Pokemon movies to discuss and he sees the future and all these plans were able to happen, and all of that success following the uh, That's So Raven-esque moment he had about the future. But now he sees another vision that he must try and make a reality thanks to the powers fading, and he needs to get access to another time ripple. Zorark becomes a pawn in all of this thanks to the illusion abilities, but the Zorark was taken away from the Zora, and so now they need to reunite the two Pokemon and make sure to solve the issues of the city for the sake of the city. The town has a past of gloomy days with no life fully blooming there, aside from the sad citizens 
citizens, but in modern day, things are going great. There's an incredible balance between people and nature, and oh look, Celebi's here. That's convenient. I'm sure things will be fine. So it's always just cool to see the little onion fella again. And he's really just here visiting the town in this time period, as it is a reflection of how far the city has come. There's a level of nice themes in this movie, seeing all the stuff that Kodai would go through for these powers, as the messages are really being what someone like him is doing. The control over what is put to broadcast, the narrative spin on stories being whispered around, and the accumulation of wealth over the sake of life blooming here. Which brings in these random side character journalists that are already looking into this man, and what shady stuff he may be up to. I feel complete in the fact that we finally have Raikou here, with the rest of the legendary beast, and they're shiny. Okay, go off. And all this illusion stuff here is possible thanks to the new generation bait Pokemon, Zoroark. Which seems like another attempt to capture the lightning in a bottle like Lucario for the fan base. But I think to a high enough extent that Zoroark gets some love, and has some powers that make for a fun enough movie for the fans. Zora, on the other hand, has a whole lot to deal with in the meantime together with the group, serving up some almost untrustworthy s dialogue because of its nature and how it consistently laughs to itself. It's a little unsettling sometimes. I also felt that way when it turned into Dawn as well, and I don't even want to look any further for what the internet did with this. But the attitude and the way that it speaks is just a mask that it uses. Much like how its illusion abilities can show the Pokemon as any other Pokemon that it chooses, to hide the insecurities of truly being this tough little Pokemon who at the end of the day just wants their mama back. And I like that the mother and child relationship is one of found family. And this Zora is not the child of the Zoroark they call mother. It's a small detail that is mentioned that was a unique angle to take their relationship in, as them not being biologically related didn't change their bond for caring for one another, wanting to be back together. The way they try to connect the full plot doesn't make as much sense in some ways, when having the bad guy become the reason the town originally lost all the luscious life it had, becoming this future seeing man with a plan to get everything to where it is today, but then needed to go get a special illusion-based Pokemon for the sake of causing terror to empty out of town so that he can start searching for that same time ripple. Once the possibility of Celebi can come back, I feel like there's a lot of just uh, going out of your way to get things done when you could have done it a simpler way or figured out some other type of maneuver. Honestly, the bad guy here does a bunch of evil stuff to truly make you not like him. Like this is a Paul level hatred almost and he nearly gets away with everything as he reaches into a time ripple at one point from Celebi as he confesses to all the bad things that he's doing and has done and laughs at the fact that the trees and the grass and all the plant life around him that has grown is disappearing and becoming nothing but death. But this was all a trick and an illusion for the journalist to capture it on tape and expose the truth, giving us a climactic ending that felt like there was stakes and delivering on a small twist that makes the resolution more believable. Like sure, you have all your giant Pokemon battles, there's a lot of fun fare throughout the city, especially because you have the legendary beasts, but the main crutch of it is resolved in an actually interesting way. And it also ends on a nice reminder of where we are going to be going soon, telling the Generation 5 Pokemon that Ash will have to be seeing that region at some point. With that some point uh, being really soon. So now we have gone over where we are at for this part when it comes to the show and the movies, but we still have to get into the Pokemon Ash captured on his journey, as well as some old friends too, to see how they evolved through the four seasons of Sinnoh, and how they were focused on thanks to Ash and his ability to be the best trainer that he could possibly be. As for now, when it comes to Ash and his pre-existing Pokemon, Pikachu gets some moments to shine in the series overall, but only to a limited extent, as some of the newer Pokemon really took Ash's attention more so. We also got the whole Thunderstone choice setup happening again, so that gave you some more emotions with Pikachu here this season. But along with the pre-existing Pokemon, Apom came on the journey from being caught late in the last series, but ended up finding her purpose in the Sinnoh region, having a fondness for the theatrics and contests, more so than battling, as then she would get traded to Dawn, and then right away, she evolved into an Ambipom. She then found a new passion in playing ping pong, and then decides to go off to Kanto to train. There's a lot of weird plot points there, but I'm happy that she found a hobby in passion. I just felt that there was a lot built up for this Apom coming from the last series to this series, and I feel like it was just to show off that Apom has a new evolution. Ash, of course, has Starly early on being the first new companion, and becomes this example for Paul of a preconceived weaker Pokemon being able to train and evolve to their powerful final form, 
in the ways that Ash is able to train. He's always been great with the bird Pokemon, so I'm not surprised here that Starly quickly went to a Staravia, and then finally a Staraptor. Ash's Turtwig has a mix of some of his previous starter grass type friends, and spends plenty of time training this Turtwig with new moves and skills. But by the end of the series here, now fully evolved into a Torterra, there seems to be a lot left to learn from the large and sized tank here, as a few of the final battles it had didn't end so great, but that opens up for future possibilities. It was just interesting to see a Pokemon that was doing great in their pre-evolution form, but thanks to getting larger, getting this reduction in speed, not being able to really deal with that. The emotional crutch of the series really comes in the form of Chimchar, who goes from Paul's abusive training standards and cruel mindset towards Pokemon, and their usefulness or not, eventually getting abandoned or, sorry, set free, but Ash is there to take him in and spend the remainder of the series training with him, helping him emotionally overcome this uncontrollable rage to truly be a confident and powerful Infernape that can stand up to Paul in the end, being able to tap into that great power with no other issues involved. Boizel and Ash have an interesting relationship as Ash originally tried catching him, but Don eventually did, but when they traded giving her the Apom, Boizel was given to Ash. They did have to find this rhythm and learn how to work together, but ended up pretty tight as Boizel was able to hold their own in some intense battles. Ash's Gligar was another chance to throw it in Paul's face by capturing what seems like the slowest and weakest Gligar of the bunch, and working directly with it to learn new moves, finding confidence and strength for battles, and giving it the final decision to evolve into a Gliscor, who had some moments to shine but faced a lot of struggles in battle. Gibble was a later entry Pokemon, but their bond forms naturally as Ash helps him learn a powerful Dragon-type move, and uses him as effectively as possible in battle, but you know, it can only do so much for now being such a later added Pokemon to the team. But what was nice was that in the end, we got a fun showcase of so many familiar friends that all got to make some fun cameos for the Sinnoh League battles, and even Cyndaquil evolves into a Quillava, which is just fun to see. I feel we dealt with a smaller amount of Pokemon here, but for the stories and connections with each of them, feeling way more impactful than ever before, showing more time with Ash training them and building up their strategies, giving us probably the most perfected version of Ash yet, rarely faulting into older tendencies with a clear growth pattern in maturity and handling situations, for the most part. But what about the other friends along the way? The human friends that made the journey, the lore, and the relationships a lot more interesting. First, let's mention Dawn, with her being how we start the series in general, bringing us a character that has a lot of Ash's best qualities to give us a new character that we can attach ourselves to early on before her path crosses with Ash. I think she played the most into why this series of four seasons felt so much bigger than before, as we follow into her focus of the contests, even more so than in Generation 3 for May. We see her have a narrative, rivals, and personal revelations all her own, making her have main character traits, getting a fair amount of the focus here. The bond's Built on this part of the journey really made Don such an enjoyable member to the team. Brock is still good old Brock, crushing on every girl that he sees. Heck, that's how he got to the Sinnoh region in the first place. Remember her? Quiz, what's her name? Exactly. And if you went back to the start of this vid to come back here to be like, oh, this is the name. See, I remembered it. Just know that I know what you did. Fine, here she is. Remember her? Well, you better not, because that was a test. That's not her. This right here was the girl from the start. Brock throughout this season gets a chance to grow on the sidelines, whether it was through his own Pokemon, getting his own egg to hatch, or when he finds a career path by the end before departing. Gary appears in the series a few times, and while they are brief, they are fairly touching moments where Ash earns a great level of respect from someone who considers him a friend now, and they even work together, and you just love to see it. Obviously, the biggest relationship that has probably built up as much as the original Ash and Gary rivalry from the first set of series, but in a way more aggressive way, was with Paul, who becomes this constant contrast for Ash, appearing here and there throughout the series to be this antagonistic voice when it comes to training methods, and a repetitive reminder for Ash that he is pathetic, no matter what he does. He is a character that I understand why he is built up a certain way, but man, it just works too well for me to not like him. From the very first moments with this guy, you end up just hating him. In fact, the more we learn about him through people like his brother Reggie, or seeing his reasonings for being the way he is thanks to Frontier Brain Brandon, to even in the very end when he's a fraction of a percent nicer after losing to Ash, I still hated him. Yeah, cool, you have some powerful Pokemon and develop a good strategy, but you treat your Pokemon awful, and for what you cause Chimchar to go through, you're heartless and I hate you. Please don't come back to the series in the future. Sorry, didn't mean to get my Blaze ability all acted up over there, but you know, I'm just passionate. 
it, okay? Anyway, we have other characters like Barry that come along who, in my opinion, don't add too much to the series aside from giving Ash more rival characters that operate on a way more chill, sometimes a little across the line level, but additional characters that added some more context to the character's journey and the future trainer levels Ash strives to be at are people like Cynthia and Flint or any of the other Elite Four members that Ash happens to run into in battle along the way, showcasing some high-level Pokemon who are no joke when it comes to battling or when it comes to saving the day. The villains here are interesting as well. Team Rocket doesn't offer too much new as they showcase some nice moments, like always somehow rooting for Ash and Pikachu when they aren't getting involved in a bad way that episode, but they still are who they are. Team Galactic was pretty fun to deal with as well, just being a cool showcased organization that had the leader being obsessed with and getting into this own private dimension through the creation Pokemon. Having a moment like the last generation where the leader wanted the end all be all for them and not for their underlings. And here, because of that, probably just dies. Similar to Pokemon Hunter J. She gets killed off, remember? And we just moved on. Speaking of moving on, that about does it for our trip throughout the Sinnoh region. Next time, we venture to a new region once more, entering the fifth generation of Pokemon, the Black and White era, taking place in Unova, where some familiar faces may return, some new faces definitely come around to adventure, but the promise of a whole new generation of Pokemon to explore. So in the meantime, comment down below some of your favorite memories with Generation 4. What made you like or dislike the Diamond and Pearl and Platinum era? See, I didn't forget Platinum. Platinum. I never would. It had the best cover art. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe for more. Later.